Really? Good evening, everyone. Well, welcome to our City Council meeting of April 15th, 2015. And at this time, I'd like to call the meeting to order. And Chief, would you please lead us in the uh, flag salute? to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's see. City Clerk Melanie, roll call please. Faria? Here. Lewis? Here. Silvera? Present. Stonegrove? Walter. Here. We have a quorum. And just as a uh, quick announcement, Elizabeth Stonegrove, our uh, city councilwoman, is not here this evening, but for good reason. She, uh, the birth of her baby, uh, was it last week, Steve? Mm -hmm. uh, Tuesday. Tuesday, and seven pounds, 15 ounces, 14 ounces. Is that close enough? Okay. Right around there. Okay. A uh, little boy. So uh, she's here, uh, she's absent for good reason, and, uh, and uh, everyone is doing fine. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So pass it around, but I want it back. Okay. <laughs> well, you can pass it around your cell phone? Yeah, well, I like to see if you get it back. <laughs> <laughs> Cute baby, though. Okay. Let's go on to item four, approval of uh, agenda. Consideration of approval of agenda, item four. Mr. Silvera. So moved. Mr. Freya. Second. Moved by Silvera, second by Faria to approve the agenda as stated. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? None. Carried. Item 5, public forum. Members of the public may address the City Council members on any item of interest that is within the jurisdiction of the City Council, which includes agenda and non-agenda items. No action will be taken on uh, non-agenda items, and speakers are limited to a five-minute presentation. Detailed guidelines are posted on the Council Chamber informational table. When you approach the podium, please state your name and city of residence. And please remember, if you have a cell phone, please place them on vibrate or turn them off. Do we have anyone who would like to speak at the public forum? My name is David Sola. I've lived here all my life and I was banished. I am I'm not a good public speaker, so how are you, Mr. Terry? Very good. <laughs> I'm not a good public speaker, so I'd just like to read it. I am here today on behalf of my neighbors and farmers and the people of Los Banners. I am happy with the fact that the people of Los Banners have shown a common sense <coughs> attitude to problems and how to solve them. I read in the papers last week that Governor Jerry Brown feels that Los Banners has been using too much water, therefore you have got to cut your usage by 35 percent. Welcome to the real world that we farmers have been living in for the last few years. How does it feel to know that you rank several notches below that of the Delta smelt, one of the most useless fish on the planet Earth when it comes to water priority? Believe me, you will never get used to it. The Los Banners area is fortunate in the fact that our aquifer is in good shape. This is very important because all of the water used in Los Banners is from wells. If you want to dig a domestic well in this area, dig 200 feet, and you will probably have plenty of water. There are areas in the valley that because of the drought and ex excessive agricultural pumping, <coughs> to dig a domestic well, you have to dig at least a 1,000 feet, and you may not get good water. If you drive a mile and a half south on Mercy Springs Road, then turn left on Phillips and go two miles, you will in that area find at least nine new agricultural wells that have been dug in the last several years. Even though only half are operating within the last several months, at least seven of us in the area because of lowering water table have had to lower our pumps and motors in our domestic wells. None of the new wells are, are on any of our properties which means that these wells are growing water from a large area, including the aquifer beneath Los Banners. The water in the aquifer belongs to everyone in the area. 
The owners of these wells have not asked for or paid anyone for using other people's water. That is not honest business practices. These big wells pump on the average at least a million gallons of water a day. The new wells in our area are all for new plantings of trees. We in our area are very worried about what will happen to our water table when all these new wells go into production. The thing that no one is talking about is how long is the drought going to last? Therefore, we have to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. We in Los Banas are fortunate that we have CCID to work with. These are very capable people, such as Chris Fagundes, the director from this area, and management, Chris White, and his staff. Los Banas has got to check the water table on a monthly basis, and if it is getting drawn down because of the drought and overpumping, then it has to curb, put a curb on wells that have been dug since the drought began. You should work with CCID. They will tell you of the laws and rules regulating water usage. The important thing that I want to emphasize is that no one knows how long the drought will last and that at the present time, water is our most valuable asset. We hope that in the future you don't have to say, doggone it, we should have taken care of this before it became such a problem. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Think about Thank this. You for your Does anyone know how long the drought is going to last? And you, I'll tell you, if it lasts any longer, water will make gold and everything else look like dirt, what it is. So now is the time to think about it and don't wait. And somebody said on TV the other day might be beginning of the 500-year drought. Hopefully it isn't, but we don't know. So, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum? Eric Lamone, resident of Los Banas, employer for public services. Um, last, last meeting, the mayor mentioned something about the cleanup being important, and it's uh, rightfully so. Um, it keeps debris off public right away. It, uh, uh, it makes, obviously, public works lives a whole lot easier, as well as myself and, and, and the workers. So, uh, so it's important. So, so I have some cleanup totals. I have three things to talk about tonight. Um, the tonnage of the spring cleanup, general refuse was 108.46 uh, tons. Uh, tires collected was 8.78 uh, 8 tons collected. Metals, 7.37 tons. And e-waste was 3.12 tons. Um, so that was quite significant. One of our bigger turnouts, it was absolutely amazing. I didn't want to say anything about it last time because I didn't have the information. I thought it would be right to let you guys know um, offhand. Also, I wanted to remind our residents uh, tonight um, uh, about their carts. And uh, I see a lot of carts that are out and they're visible to the public. Some people, they, they're, they're at the curb. And I wanted uh, to, to, uh, to have a friendly reminder and let them know that, you know, I'm going to read something here. Uh, uh, city codes govern how and when you may place your trash, recycling, and green waste carts uh, out for service. Uh, car carts must be placed at the curb no later than 6 p.m. the day before your service, uh, Sunday 6 p.m. for Monday service, etc. You must remove your carts no later than 11.50 p.m. on the date of service. You must store your carts in an area where they are not visible from the street. Carts not placed out prior to 6 a.m. on the service day may be missed, so just make sure, you know, typically we go back, so, I mean, if, uh, as a courtesy. Uh, so if you're, obviously, another big thing, too, is that a lot of carts are being stolen for whatever reason, transients, you know, who knows. Uh, you can call the police non-emergency number at 827-7070 to obtain a case number, and uh, every, every situation is a little different, so um, more often than not, we just bring it out there, but... But, you know, just in case, you know, we try to make it easier for the public to, um, to get a case number. And then, uh, or, or call City Hall, 827-7000 for a replacement. Um, I wanted to bring up, uh, talk to Jenny Halpin of uh, MCAG, and I'm sure all of you guys obtained the, uh, this, I mean, via mail, uh, email. Uh, House or Hazardous Waste Event Collection, uh, Saturday, April 18th. Um, I don't see a, a time. Um, but it's going to be at the uh, Highway 59 landfill. I imagine it's probably from open to close. They generally open at 7 a.m. to to uh, to 2 p.m. 
uh, uh, for chemical transport, anything serious, uh, you can contact uh, 722-4228 for more information and schedule a time for drop-off. Um, anyway, just general information, paint thinners, uh, gas, uh, you know, um, doesn't mention anything about uh, any sharps material, but uh, anyway, so just some knowledge. And also, I, um, while I'm here, uh, I wanted to, obviously, we got some people here for 4-H and FFA. My kids are highly involved with it. And I uh, just wanted to say that I, I, I want to encourage residents to go out there and, and see how hard these kids work because they do work tremendous. I, I'm with these kids every day, seven days a week. And, uh, and it, it teaches them discipline and, and uh, obviously uh, budgeting, you know, money-wise because stuff can get real expensive. Re the reward in the end is tremendous because um, it's potentially they can make good money price per pound. Uh, for instance, we have sheep, so it's a seven-day-a-week uh, job. There's no days off. Unfortunately, these kids are out there every day, so I just wanted to give them kudos. So anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum? Hi, Ashley Williams, resident of Los Banos, um, also with Habitat for Humanity, and I just wanted to extend the invitation to everyone here and the public including city council members and city manager to our um, uh, home dedication that's happening this Saturday. Um, it's going to be at 1 p.m. And uh, if you can't make it at 1, there's going to be an open house uh, at 537 M Street, the location of the home dedication, from 10 to 2 p.m. And uh, it's basically a, an event where we're welcoming home the, the next Habitat Partner family who's purchasing the house, um, who's dedicated and put more than 500 hours of their own time into building the, or to rehabbing the, rehabbing the house. And uh, it's just a pretty neat experience to watch um, folks become homeowners and, and celebrate with them. So anyway, it's a great event for Habitat for Humanity, and we just encourage um, as many of you guys to come out as possible. So thank you. All are invited. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum? Good evening. Bertha Faria, La Spanish Chamber of Commerce and La Spanish resident. Just a couple of reminders of upcoming events for the chamber. Tomorrow we will be cutting the ribbon for Spacetail Cricket Wireless at 2 o'clock. Everyone is invited. They are located at 1313 Pacheco in Suite C. And then on Saturday is our annual downtown spring street fair. It starts at 8.30 till 3. We have over 115 vendors signed up. And there's still that, are, that have faxed applications in. So we're going to squeeze everybody in. Um, then on Monday, the 20th, beginning at noon, we are offering, in partnership with the Los Banos Enterprise, a social media marketing seminar. And that's going to be held um, at Espanas. It's a free seminar, and lunch is available, um, should you like, with the Espanas Fajita Buffet. And then on Thursday, we're welcoming another new member, Posh a Boutique Salon. They're located right downtown, 1005 6th Street. And their grand opening and ribbon cutting is at 430. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum? Good evening, everyone. My name is Francisco Vasquez, Jr. I'm a resident of Los Banos. And today, <clears throat> um, I'm just here to issue a few thank yous. Um, I'm here representing my father, my pastor, Francisco Vasquez, Sr., in our church, Vision Familiar. On April 5th, 2015, as the church, we celebrated our 15th anniversary of parading through the city of Los Banos with approximately 350 adults and youth with children with the sole purpose of praying and blessing our city, its residents, school system, businesses, and government. We firmly believe in the word of God written in Jeremiah 29, 7, saying, also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. As a church, we believe we have the responsibility of continuously praying and asking God for our city, just as the government has the responsibility of caring for the people it's over. So in this attempt, last month, we advised our 24-hour prayer chain that is currently comprised of 72 total hours, that is 72 different people praying continuously around the clock beginning Monday night through Thursday night to focus their prayers, just as I'm sure all the people of our city in their prayers, to reduce the crime in our city. Now, not only do we, we don't, 
believe in coincidences, but we do believe in cause and effect. So it was great to hear when our police chief announced that just last month, crime has gone down in our city. Even though I believe in the power of prayer, I also believe in the hard work of those that make this possible. So we would like to thank our current local government officials for allowing us to freely express our faith by parading through the streets of our city. We would like to thank the police department and its volunteers for always in the 15 years we have been parading to render their excellent service through this. Not only do we see the protection and the security the police bring to our city, but also their willingness to serve the community. The volunteers did an excellent job this year in providing their service for our church and the parade that we, that we hosted. We would also like to thank the Los Banos Fire Department and volunteers that in previous years have taken out the fire trucks from the bay and greeted the entire congregation with lights and sirens as we walked by the station or have taken the fire trucks to our facilities on October 31st for our yearly kids festival that now we have hosted for over 10 years and now together with New Beginnings Church in the last three years has also partnered up with us in doing. Every year, God willing, as we continue to do this, we would just like everyone who would like to have their voice heard to join us and for everyone to know that as a church, Vision Familiar will always continue to pray for our city, for this city. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum? Not seeing or hearing anyone, I will now close the public forum and move on to item six presentations. And the first one, 6A, presentation by the Heritage Foundation regarding the Merced County Spring Fair. I like Los Banos Fair, but what are you gonna do? <laughs> so who's here to represent the, uh, the Heritage Foundation? Come on up. Okay, and but, Mr. Silvera, do you want to? Okay. We'll get you a microphone. Yeah, turn around and look that way. There you go. I've seen this before. Here we go. There Mr. Silvera is one of our fair board directors, and he's here tonight knowing, uh, having some personal knowledge of all the young ladies up here, the fine representation from Los Banos, and so he will be introducing everyone. Well, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but just as a quick introduction to what they're here for and what they're doing. So I'm on the fair board as well as on the Heritage Foundation Board. And for those of you that aren't familiar, a few years back, um, the state cut its funding to fairs. And so we, we saw the need as a fair board to, we needed to make up those funds. And for our local fair, it was somewhere in the neighborhoods of between 180 and $200,000 a year of funding that we lost from the state of California. So we started a Heritage Foundation. And the very first year, it was put together rather quickly and with a few letters sent out and, and calling a few people, we raised $40,000 in, in a short amount of time. So then we had another year to really work on it, and we brought in and, and went out and, and tried to get some corporate sponsors, if you will. And I was, last year, we raised close to $300,000. And so and part of that money, 10% of all that money raised, automatically goes back to our youth and scholarships. So as we're going down this road, we felt like we needed a group of the people that we're trying to, you know, we're trying to protect our fair for the next generation. And so we wanted to get their perspective and what the fair means, means to them. So we put together this Heritage Foundation presentation team, and they're going to give you guys a little presentation. So I'm going to have them introduce themselves, and then they'll start with their presentation. Thank you. I'm Corey Falaski. I'm 15 years old and a freshman at Las Vegas High School. My name is Hannah Young, and I'm a 17-year-old junior at Los Banos High School. My name is Isabella Alberti, and I'm 16, and I'm a sophomore at Los Banos High School. My name is Paige Meniz. I'm a junior at Los Banos High School, and I'm 16 years old. My name is Peyton Brazil. I'm 17 years old and a junior at Los Banos High School. My name is Andrea Pineda, and I am a 17-year-old senior at Los Banos High School. Henry Miller came to California in the 1850s with the hard work ethic and a passion for agriculture. In 1890, he hosted the first May Day picnic 
which soon after became a tradition of thanking the community and increasing awareness to the agriculture industry. This tradition is alive today as the mission of the May Day Fair is to create memories worth repeating by providing quality entertainment, education, and courteous service in a safe facility. Every single person in Los Banos has their own personal story about the Merced County Spring Fair. During fair time, our whole city erupts with excitement over the food booths, exhibits, and all the different attractions. Fair is a time that brings our community together over greasy food and tractor pulls. Everyone has their stories to share about their experience at the fair. Mine all started in a brand new pair of sparkle boots and a little lamb I walked around the Pee Wee Showmanship ring. That day I sparkled in those boots 13 years ago, I could not have been more excited to win the Best Dressed Award. This year will be my eighth year showing livestock at the fair. And outside of the show ring, I represent the fair by wearing the sparkle crown of Miss Mayday. Families mark their calendars each year and clear their schedules for fair time. Whether it's simply to attend and enjoy exhibits, food, or entertainment, or to compete in fair competitions, fair memories last for a lifetime. As I come from a long line of people passionate about agriculture and our Mayday Spring Fair, my family has been participating in May Day since I can remember. My friends and family tell me how much they love their animals. And this being my first year showing, I see the hard work that is put into raising livestock. The May Day Spring Fair has shaped me and our Ag Society through the teachings of tradition, responsibility, and small town values. Over 125 years later, over 5,000 youth tour Little Hands and Henry Miller Farm, which emphasizes our most valuable industry, agriculture. Even though California ranks number one in agriculture, it is surprising how many people do not know where their food and fiber comes from. The youth can take a walk through Henry Miller Farm to pet animals for the very first time, or take a drive on a tractor through Little Hands to plant corn, or to even see where their eggs they ate for breakfast came from. A challenge is an offer to increase in ability or skill. The agriculture industry faces one of its biggest challenges today, such as the lack of resources and specifically the drought. The May Day Fair challenges over 5,000 youth to raise livestock or build and create agricultural mechanics and home economics projects in hopes of winning that blue ribbon. However, the May Day Fair faces the biggest challenge behind the scenes as Governor Jerry Brown has cut over $200,000 from county fairs due to budget cuts and the downward spiral of horse racing. As we face this challenge, we need your help to make our fair stay the true May Day Fair that Henry Miller made long ago instead of just a carnival of rising games. Let's give the May Day Fair the opportunity to highlight agriculture and the leaders of tomorrow through the youth by offering, offering ribbons, scholarships, and supporting Little Hands and Henry Miller Farm as hands-on experiences and not just something the future will read about in history books. We all know about the Heritage Foundation and how it preserves our fair. In 2014, over $35,000 were awarded in scholarships to our local youth. In that same year, we graduated our first Heritage Foundation presentation team in hopes of them accomplishing great things in their lives and contributing back to our most valuable industry, agriculture. All of us who know and love the May Day Fair have an opportunity and an obligation to share our stories like we are doing right now. I believe we can take the May Day Fair to greater heights. When Henry Miller held his first May Day picnic in 1890, he probably never imagined that his beloved tradition would one day turn into the Merced County Spring Fair. This annual event highlights agriculture in our daily lives. We need to share our stories and support agriculture in the more urban areas.
We need to keep 4-H and FFA members contributing back to agriculture and educating the hungry public and why growing food and fiber in our valley is so important. In agriculture, we have all. It's safe. It's fresh. It is reliable. It is renewable. It is farm to table in our backyard. We are your best environmental partner. By supporting the Heritage Foundation of the Merced County Spring Fair, you are ensuring that Henry Miller's legacy will live on. Join us to cultivate leaders and preserve the rich agricultural heritage valued by all. Thank you. So in closing, I want to say we have a pretty awesome set of future leaders in agriculture up here. And so that's what we have to look forward to as people in agriculture. I'm, I'm, I'm in agriculture. Maybe a lot of the people in this room and a lot of people watching in one way or another are involved in agriculture agriculture industry. So I want to thank them for being here tonight and give them one more big round of applause because they do an awesome job at public speaking and getting, getting our word out there on why agriculture is so important to us locally and to this valley and for that matters the state the country and the world thank you ladies Okay, our next item is 6B, Proclamation Recognizing Volunteer Week. And could I please have the members of the VITAL come forward? to emphasize this in the proclamation but since 2003 these individuals and others have donated 36,500 hours of service to the city of Los Banos and from a personal note we cannot get along without them they are just individuals who have dedicated their life to Los Banos have stayed in Los Banos and have given back all the time that they've been here. And with that, I proudly read this proclamation recognizing National Volunteer Week. Whereas one of America's greatest national resources is its volunteers and the human resources they devote towards a healthy, productive, and humane society. Throughout the year, local citizens sign up to assist the Los Banos Police Department vital volunteers interacting to advance law enforcement and the Los Banos Volunteers for Animals. Since its inception of the vital, vital program in 2003, members have donated 36,500 hours of service to the city of Los Banos. Vital volunteers provide services such as information and fingerprinting booths during events, crowd and traffic control, park and school safety patrol, graffiti abatement, evidence management, statistical reporting, taxi licensing, DUI checkpoint assistance, clerical assistance, and emergency call-outs. Vital volunteers have been called at all hours to assist with major problems such as power outages, fire, gas leaks, locating missing children, and much more. The Los Banos Volunteers for Animals open the local shelter every Saturday from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. for adoptions and work in conjunction 
with animal rescues to transfer dogs and cats who have not yet found a home. In 2014, the Los Vanas Volunteers for Animals donated over 5,500 hours of service to the city of Los Banos. Each year, these volunteers give freely of their time and energy, only asking for a smile and a thank you for their many hours of service. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the mayor and the city council members of the city of Los Banos recognize and take great pleasure in honoring the vital volunteers of Los Banos Volunteers for Animals during the National Volunteer Week, April 12th through April 18th, and convey sincere gratitude and appreciation for their dedication, selflessness, and compassionate efforts. Thank you so much for what you do. Volunteers for Animals, thank you. And please, as long as you are able, you are welcome in the city of Los Banos at the police department and to Volunteers for Animals. And we just love having you here. And thank you so much for everything that you've done. Hey, do you want to say a few words? Not really. Oh, not really? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say uh, a couple of words for you. And a couple of words I would say is that if you're interested in volunteering, I see a church group here, and if you're interested in volunteering, I will tell you that the background check is just as stringent as it would be for a police officer because you have access to many, many records that no one else would have. And the police chief would tell you the same thing, that if you are interested in volunteering uh, to take care of animals or to volunteer at the, uh, for vital volunteers, we would love to have you. And I know these individuals would love to have you also and join their family. So uh, please let us know, and you can join by, or, or thinking of joining, contacting our police department and asking to speak to one of the dispatchers or to the police chief himself. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The next one is proclamation recognizing the month of April as call before you dig month. Now, we're going to explain this. Now, the person here to accept this is our former councilwoman, Anna Bellotti Brooks. And not to say that she dug a hole when she was here as the city council person, but this is safe digging. <laughs> yeah, would you come forward, Anna? <laughs> In fact, she was an excellent council person. I would know because I was her junior high principal. <laughs> and on behalf of the City Council, we would like to present this proclamation. And people would say, why are we presenting a proclamation to dig safely? <laughs> because if you don't, you're going to be in contact with Anna, a public relations officer, because of PG&E. And uh, you don't want that because the bill can be substantial if you hit something that belongs to them and also cause a, kind of a big explosion. So... Uh, <laughs> At this time, I would like to present this proclamation recognizing California Safe Digging Month. The 811 Call Before You Dig program is a vital public education and awareness program that will keep Californians safe, and education is the key to promoting safe digging practices. Excavators, homeowners, and professional contractors can save time and money while making California communities a safer place to live and work by dialing 811 in advance of digging projects. Not 911. 911 is after you don't dial the 811. Okay. <laughs> Utility lines are often buried only a few inches underground making them easy to strike and cause damage and harm even during the shallow excavation projects. More than 170,000 underground utility lines are struck each year in the United States and approximately 33% of all digging damages in the United States result from not calling 811 before digging. 
undesired consequences such as service interruption, outages, damage to the public and private infrastructure and property, damage to the environment, personal injury and death, and risk or risk by failing to call 811 before digging or safely marking utility lines. As California's econom economy continues to recover from the recession and the state economic recovery stimulates new construction, new construction requires supporting infrastructure and California's underground utility infrastructure is jeopardized by unintentional damage caused by those who fail to call before digging. The free notification service provided by underground service alert of Northern California and Nevada has dramatically reduced the number of accidents causing property damage, personal injury, and the interruption of vital services. California public agencies should enforce California government code 4216 regarding safe excavation practices permitting uh, and civil penalties. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the mayor and the city council members of the city of Los Banos do hereby proclaim the month of April as California Safe Digging Month and encourage all excavators, homeowners, and professional contractors to call 811 in advance of all digging projects. Nana, we gratefully uh, present this to you and to say that uh, you've always been a, a person who has represented Los Banos well and an individual that uh, can help us with any of these public relations uh, issues that come up. And if you'd like to say a few words to, uh, to just reinforce what the proclamation said, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor, very much. Um, so you heard him. We should all be calling 811 before we're digging, uh, whether it be a big hole for a tree in our backyard for a fence, we had a Merced uh, City Council member who was digging a hole for a fence who dug into a gas line and received a bill not only from the City of Merced but then also um, from PG&E. And most of all, we want you to do it because we want you to be safe, we want employees to be safe. Um, it's really, natural gas is a safety hazard um, and we want you to stay away from it if at all possible um, in your backyard. So thank you. I have. Um, you actually had six dig-ins in Los Banos last year, so we want to make that fewer this year is our goal. I have worksheets about 811 that I'm going to give to you, and then I also have for everyone on the dais, call before you dig gloves, so when you're digging in the garden, you'll be reminded to call before you dig. 811, it's a free call. Thank you very much. Thank you. Not that I'm ever going to do any gardening, but. <laughs> I'll ask you who the council member was in Merced later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A few months ago, when the individual is here, Tony Dutra, approached me about, uh, about, um, saying, you know, Los Banos has gone through a tough time, and we've had houses that have, uh, that have been in disrepair, and, and now uh, people are buying those houses, and they are fixing them up. And he said, what do you think about honoring some of these individuals? And I said, you know, I said, I think that is an excellent idea. So over the last few months, uh, I've talked to the city manager about it, and uh, I've, the last meeting, I encourage the city council members now to... Uh, to uh, ride around town, and if they see a house that's, uh, that's, that, that stands out, and there are many of them, and there are many homes, and this is the first recognition. It's not going to stop. We're going to continue recognizing uh, people who have uh, made an extraordinary effort to fix up their homes and to make them look nice, and to do it within bounds as much as they can, and Mr. Silva was here talking about the water, but everyone understands water usage, and I will tell you that Los Banos, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, we were under the 2013 limits. Am I correct for water usage? Yes, we, Los Banos was actually one of the poster children who, who, who uh, conserved water quite well. And now we're being asked to conserve 25% more under the 13, 2013 levels. So you do a good job and you get penalized more. So. 
So anyway, uh, we have uh, we have with us tonight um, Brian Borges, Kim Borges, and uh, Jim Torrey. And they are the residents and owners of the home on 4th and uh, J Street. And that home uh, recently had, uh, had gone through some hard times because the home next door unfortunately experienced a huge fire that destroyed the house and it burned one side of your house, didn't it? And, and that house is, uh, in fact, Mr. Freer used to own that house at one time. And it was, it was quite a show place. And, and uh, it, it, the, the, the foundation is about eight feet thick. I know that from a kid because my father would tell me. And there's not a crack in that house. And the house was built many, many decades ago. And so now uh, they have uh, uh, spruced up the house really well and uh, the front yard. And the house looks, uh, looks wonderful. So tonight we just wanted to congratulate them as one of our first recipients. And could you please three come forward? Yes. Sure, you can come down. <laughs> yeah. The house was built in 1925. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have one of the former owners just give you a little talk here. Yeah, it, it, nice to see you. It was our first house, and um, both our children were born while we lived there. And when we first when we first bought it. The windows, it had 35 wood sash windows and uh, all, gla all plate glass, and they hadn't been re puttied in probably 15, 20 years. So I spent one summer puttying the windows, another summer re building a new fence in the back, and um, we redid and repainted the thing. The trap door to the the trap door down into the basement was built by our Uncle Frank Lawrence and I because he was worried that our, our baby would crawl down to the basement and get hurt. Uh, it has a beautiful old basement there. It's a classic old house. The, wa the external walls are a foot thick because the brick, sandstone brick you see on the outside is, on the, inside that is another layer of red brick and then an inch of plaster with metal lath. During the mighty earthquake in 1989, the entire house just moved and nothing cracked, nothing shook, nothing, I mean, the whole thing just moved as a single unit. And um, it, it's quite a beautiful place. Uh, it was owned originally by, uh, I think, Wilson, uh, the editor of the newspaper. And then uh, Ed Love had it for many years. And then we took it over and we bought it in 87 and, and sold it in 92, if I remember right. Sold it to your brother. Yeah, you're, you know, bless his, uh, may he rest in peace. Um, and uh, he was a very wonderful man, a pleasant man. We enjoyed meeting him very much. So gr congratulations on this award and, and thank you for fixing the place up even more. And that big fire didn't do it any good either. It took down the trellis I built. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and uh, you know, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. My father was the elementary school principal for 37 years, so one of his students is the mayor. And if Dad could be here, he's up there looking down, and he's probably looking at all these people who he knew all over the community. And I'm sure he feels that, or he should feel, he did a very fine job. And I'd like to introduce Brian Gorges and uh, Kim, his wife, who... Uh, I have known for a decade, and they've done wonderful services for me, and I, I've always commended uh, Brian for and Kim for the excellent work they do on these properties, and they've done other properties before I met them, and got to know them, they came over, and I said, you know, we're doing this for my brother, yeah. and it's beautiful. Yeah. I just want to thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to present you with these proclamations in appreciation of your efforts to improve the landscaping and beautification of your home. Yep. Okay. And Brian and Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, can you give me a report real quick? Yes. Real time. Okay. Group photo. On three, big smiles. Two and three. Thank you, sir. So again, council members, if you uh, see an extraordinary effort in uh, beauty home beautification, uh, please bring it forth and we can present an award. There you go. Okay. 
Okay. All right. Let's go on to item seven, consideration of approval of consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and we voted on in one motion unless removed from the consent agenda by a city council member. And tonight we have Lucy. Items on the consent agenda are as follows. Warrant numbers 152586 through 152826 in the amount of $1,154,632.93. Acceptance of the third quarter investment report for 2014-2015. And those items are to be approved as submitted. Okay. Is there any city council member who would like to remove an item for discussion? If not, do I have a motion? Mr. Silvera. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda as submitted. Okay. Do I have a second? Mr. Freya. Second. Motion by Silvera, second by Freya to approve the consent agenda as stated. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? None carried. Public hearing, item eight. If you challenge a proposed action as described herein in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at the public hearing described herein or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. Item 8A, public hearing. To receive public comment and consideration of general plan amendment 2015-01, zone change number 2015-01, and tentative parcel map 2015-01, for Habitat for Humanity, Westside County Incorporated, for the rezone of three parcels, currently zoned low density, low density residential R1 to medium density residential R2, with the remainder of the 3,300 foot parcel to Highway Commercial 8C for the project site located at 537, 543, and 547M Street. Assessor's parcel number, number 026-044-012-013 and 014. And 8A1, City Council Resolution number 5651, approving the General Plan Amendment 0215-01 for the property located at 537, 543, and 547 M Street. More specifically identified, assessor's parcel number is 026, 044, 012, uh, 013, and 014. And ordinance number 1128, amending the official zoning map by rezoning the property located at 537, 543, and 547 M Street with low density residential R1 to medium density residential R2 and the remainder of the 3,300 square foot parcel to Highway Commercial HC. This is a second reading and adoption. Uh, the resolution is just a simple motion. Okay, at this time, I am going to call upon uh, Assistant Planner Elms to give us a description. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So on April 1st, 2015, the City Council waived the first reading and introduced by title ordinance number 1128 and made a motion of intent to adopt resolution number 5651. Uh, the applicant for this particular project, and I'm just going to give you a brief uh, background on this project. I won't go into the deep detail that we did on the first reading. So the applicant is Habitat for Humanity, Westside Merced County, Inc. And they're requesting a general plan amendment. Um, this is to redesignate the land uses for the properties located at 537, 543, and 547 M Street from low density residential to medium density residential with the remainder portion to commercial. And then the second entitlement request is to rezone the properties from low density residential, which is R1, to medium density residential R2. Uh, and with the 3,300 uh, remainder portion to Highway Commercial. And that remainder portion is actually designated uh, as Highway Commercial because it's an existing storage shed uh, that the property owners, um, the existing property own, um, and then they will retain that 3,300 square foot um, uh, warehouse and the property on the front, which will be parceled off um, based on the parcel map that the Planning Commission previously approved, would be parceled off and then um, uh, bought by uh, Habitat for Humanity. So the property is located 
at 537 and 543 and 547 M Street. It's approximately 270 feet west of 6th Street, and the site is surrounded by single-family residential dwelling units uh, to the north and to the west, and commercial uses <coughs> immediately adjacent to the east and the south. Um, and there is an alley on the southern boundaries of the property um, allowing access to that um, most southern parcel uh, from the south. And um, the environmental that was done, uh, so the CEQA analysis that was done, uh, this project was deemed categorically exempt from the provisions of CEQA per Article 19, Section 15315, and that it's a minor land division. And section 15332 and that it's an infill development project. Stacy, you have a question? Can you put the map up on the screen? Sure. I have a question about an address. To okay, I apologize. I don't have no, a map, no, but I, I do have an open map. right there, just so I can ask you the okay. question. In the, the, on 8A1, it says 537, 543, and 547. On your map there in the middle pro property, it reads 549. So is it 543 or 549? That's actually 543. It looks like it says 549, but it's 543 on my GIS. It should say 543. Right. I'll take your word for it. It's 543. All right. Thank you. You know, on this one, too, it looks like it's, it's yeah, it should be 543. And that's correct, right, Habitat? Yes. It looks like a nine. Okay. Well, I apologize. It should. So we get that information from the county assessor's office, not okay. to throw them under the bus, no, no. but <laughs> <laughs> it's 543. It's Sorry, Mark. I didn't catch it, but the map, does it does say 549. That's an I. Okay. So is it? No, it is 543. And to is. confirm with okay. uh, Habitat, who also says it is 543, so their the application says. the paperwork's correct, we're yes. fine. Okay. And their uh, their application does say 543. Ned, do you have a number you want to throw out or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't researched. Uh, my name is Ned Ryan. I'm with Habitat for Humanity. Uh, I haven't thoroughly researched it. I suggested the number 543 because it fits between 547 and 537. But I've seen the 549 number, and I don't know if that comes from the assessor's office or somewhere else, but it didn't make sense to me because it's not in sequence. It may have originated from the tax rolls from the assessor's office. However, the city does authorize and does designate addresses. That's done between the fire department and the community and economic development department. And based on sequencing, it would make sense to have 543. It does not make sense to have 549 and then have 547 next door. It does not meet our sequencing. So yeah, you're absolutely correct. And plus the APN numbers are right, which are the actual That's definite description of the property. That's what I wanted to okay. make sure we get Okay, so I'm going to clarify for the public. It's 537, 543, and 547, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. So uh, just wrapping up on the uh, presentation, so the environmental analysis, it is uh, categorically exempt. A public hearing notice was published in the Las Vegas Enterprise, and as of today's date, uh, no comments have been received. So with that, staff is act asking that the City Council uh, consider um, opening the public hearing, uh, closing the public hearing, and then adopting ordinance number 1128 and resolution number 5651 um, for Habitat for Humanity West Side, um, re-designating uh, for a general plan amendment 537, 543, and 547 M Street, and then a rezone for those same properties. And that concludes my presentation, and Habitat is here to answer any questions. Thank you. Council members, do you have any questions at this time? Okay, let's go to the public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak on these items? Uh, City Council Resolution Number 5651 and Ordinance Number 1128. Is there anyone who would like to comment? Not seeing or hearing anyone, I will now close the public hearing, bring it back to Council level, and we have uh, actually three actions. And the first one will be to 
uh, approve City Council Resolution Number 5651. Do I have a motion, Mr. Silvera? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve City Council Resolution Number 5651 as read by title. Mr. Freya. I'll second that motion. Motion by Silvera, second by Freya to approve City Council Resolution Number 5651. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? None carried. Okay, now we'll go to ordinance number 1128. And uh, we have two motions for to waive the second reading and adopt the ordinance as submitted. Mr. Silvera. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to waive the second reading on ordinance number 1128 as read by title. Mr. Freya. Second. Motion by Silvera, second by Freya to waive the second reading on ordinance number 1128. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? None carried. Mr. Silvera. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to adopt ordinance number 1128 as read by title. Mr. Freya. Second that motion. Motion by Silvera, second by Freya to um, adopt uh, red ordinance number 1128. And this is a roll call vet vote. Director Maloney. Freya. Yes. Lewis. Yes. Silvera. Yes. Stonegrove. Peralta. Yes. Okay, motion passes. Item B, public hearing. To receive public comment and consider extending the development agreement for the villages at Stone Creek for subdivision. Ordinance number 1129, approving the First Amendment to the development agreement relative to the development known as the Villages at Stone Creek 4, making certain findings related thereto and authorizing the mayor to execute said agreement on behalf of the city. And we will go to Assistant Planner Elms. Oh, I'm sorry. Here we Thank go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, let's see if we've got Okay, so uh, this proposal tonight is for the Villages 4 DA extension, and the request is uh, for an amendment to the Villages 4 development agreement. It does expire this year, July 15, 2015, and the request is for a 10-year extension um, with no other amendments by uh, the developer, the applicant. But the city is requesting an amendment regarding the annexation or formation to a landscape and lighting district. So um, this particular area uh, would be in a district that um, we could possibly have the potential to um, become solvent again. So um, we're taking that opportunity through this uh, development agreement extension. This is where the property is located. It's in the southwest quadrant of the city of Los Banos. It's west of Ortigolita Road, east of Badger Flat Road, north of Pioneer Road, and south of Cardoza Road. It's within the... Um, Stone Creek area plan, which uh, encompasses this whole area um, from essentially Ortigolita Road all the way uh, west to Los Manos Creek. Uh, a development agreement, I just wanted to back up and take a few moments just to explain what development agreements are. Um, they're a legally binding contract be between the city and a project developer. They specify the terms and conditions of a proposed development project. And development agreements secure vested rights, and they allow the city to secure certain benefits as well. So there's, um, it gives vested rights to the developer, but it also creates some benefits as well for the city. Um, it is enabled by the California Government Code, so it's, it's allowed through the Government Code. And typically, these are used for land use developments that are done in phases. And so they're, they're going to be done over time, a long, a long period of time. And so with that, uh, a development agreement can be used as a mechanism to extend the life of a map and keep it going. Um, it also protects the developer from spending time, energy, money on a project that's only to have the conditions and standards change. So it really vests them, locks them in to their conditions and their specifications that they're required at the time that the development agreement is set into place. Uh, rules and regulations change all the time, and in order for a developer to have assurance that at the time they go to put in those streets, sidewalks, infrastructure, those standards will not change, and so it creates some assurances for them. Um, also, tentative and final maps, so just an, a little explanation on what those are. So tentative maps are used to create five or more lots. 
a uh, tentative map is not recordable. So a tentative map is really just the vision, what it is going to be uh, tentatively before it becomes recordable and becomes legal lots. Uh, they do have short lifespans. According to the Subdivision Map Act, they are only good for 24 months, so two years. Uh, but the city of Los Banos and other jurisdictions also have this exception as well. Um, if asked for an extension for another 12 months, it can be granted. So most of the time, a tentative map does have the life of 36 months, three years. Um, a subdivider must satisfy the conditions or enter into an improvement agreement in order to be able to subdivide the lots. And after conditions are satisfied and the final map is in substantial conformance, our city engineer uh, deems it complete and then the final map can be recorded. So once a tentative map expires, it cannot be revived. So after those 36 months are over and um, it's not in, uh, this tentative map would not be in a development agreement, it does not have any vested rights, it expires. The subdivider would have to start all over again from scratch. That's a lot of time, that's a lot of money, that's a lot of time and money also on the city's expense to have to redo everything all over again. Um, so it's to the benefit of both the city and the developer to extend the lives of uh, these certain maps. In this um, development agreement, the original development agreement was for 10 years. It was uh, made effective July 15, 2015, um, and the life of it is to July 15, 2015. Um, excuse me, back up. It was July 15, 2005 to July 15, 2015. It covers approximately 126 acres within the Stone Creek area plan. And the purpose really was to extend the life of the map until, um, it also extends the life of the map until one year after the development agreement expires. So say tonight, uh, City Council, you decide that you're not in favor of extending this development agreement. This tentative map would expire next year, July 15, 2016. So just to put that into perspective. Uh, the Villages 4 is uh, primarily residential R1 um, zoning and it does have a planned development zoning um, overlay. What that means is that um, extra flexibility was given into this particular uh, development and in so this the developer had to lock in their architecture, um, streetscape, uh, street lights, those types of amenities, those were all locked in uh, with the development in order to get that extra flexibility and zoning with that planned development overlay. It consists of 309 single-family residential lots. That's what was allocated for this particular tentative map. And it uh, also designated a over a 13-acre school site and four park lots. Two of those park lots are developed. One of them is Cardoza um, Park, or Oliveira Park off of Cardoza. And there's a park off of uh, Travertine uh, that is also developed. Now, the school lot was deemed unacceptable for construction of a school because of the exist existence of a high-powered PG&E transmission pipeline, which bisects the original school site. And that original school site was at the corner of Pioneer and Ortigalita. So the school site was moved, was negotiated with the school district, and was moved and is under construction now off of Prairie Springs. Um, so uh, we anticipate in the future that the developer would come in and redesignate um, that particular area plan area. And uh, for future development, it would probably be, in uh, my thoughts, residential R1 is that's what fits in that uh, particular area. Uh, the final map. Um, for this has been approved. So there are certain final, there's two final maps that have been recorded in this area. And it's for um, 93 of the 309 lots approved in this tentative map. There are 16 units constructed currently right now. And there are 77 vacant lots. So basically paper lots ready to go. And there's 216 lots conditionally approved, just not recorded. Um, so moving on, what this development 
agreement extension would do. It would extend the life of the map for an additional 10 years. Uh, the last development agreement extension that you saw was for villages 2A and 3. That extension was only for five years, but that was a smaller piece of land, and it just consisted of really one final map that needed to be recorded for Villages 3. In this particular um, tentative map, only two phases have been recorded, and I believe it exists of six or so phases, which um, Ray DeSaw could probably correct for me. Um, but it does have more phases going on, and it should be developed as the market dictates. It should not be developed because a um, development agreement is expiring or a map is expiring. So it's in the best interest um, of the city as staff feels that, um, that the life should be extended. The development agreement also amends language to require the 216 tentative lots to form or annex to a landscape and lighting district for the proportionate share for the special benefits the individual lots receive. So new language has been put in. Not only would they be required to um, annex or form into a landscape and lighting district, but they would also need to pay their proportionate share. Um, based on what it, the true costs are of, are of that landscape and lighting district. So um, public hearing, um, what public hearing notices were published in the Las Vegas Enterprise on April 3rd, 2015, and they were mailed to the 300-foot radius on April 3rd, 2015, so all those property owners within 300 feet of this particular project site. And um, as of today's date, no comments have been received. And then the Planning Commission also recommended approval of this uh, development agreement extension on March 25th, 2015. So with that, staff is recommending uh, that the City Council approve a motion of intent to improve the first am amendment to the Villages at Stone Creek 4 development agreement, and then waive the first reading of Ordinance 1129, introduce Ordinance 1129, and then continue the item and public hearing until May 6, 2015. So that concludes my staff report. And Ray DeSaw is here from uh, Stone Creek Properties, Anderson Homes, to answer any questions as well. All right. Council members, do you have any questions at this time? All right. Let's go on to. Yeah, one. Well, oh, <coughs> sorry. Thank you. Um, Stacy and and also to uh, Mark, I'm hoping that perhaps as we talked about with the last um, projects that we heard that um, it looks like our city is doing really well with parks. Uh, Anderson Holmes built the Oliveira Park on Ortigalita and uh, Cardoza. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a fairly sizable park. So I would certainly like to see any additional parks that are being scheduled for this project to be done away with and allow the developer to build houses in those areas. So okay. that would just be work. some we'll of my suggestions too. for that. Okay, thank you. All right. Let's open the public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak on ordinance number 1129? Not seeing or hearing anyone, I will now close the public hearing on ordinance number 1129 and bring it back to council level. And we have two actions, or actually three, but um, there's one that's not listed. And I need a motion of a motion of intent to approve the agreement first. It's not listed on your agenda, but uh, we need to do that. Mr. Faria? Uh, I would make the motion of intent to adopt resolution uh, to approve to approve um, ordinance number one one two nine or the resolution. Where, where's my resolution listed? We don't. Okay. Do we have a number for that resolution? Apparently, there was some confusion. There is no resolution. We're just asking you to uh, make a motion of intent to adopt the first extension agreement, because if you're not intending on adopting that, there's no reason to introduce the ordinance, which is the next action. So it's kind of a two-step. There is no resolution, just a motion of intent to adopt that agreement. Okay. Of the development agreement? Yes. Yes. I would, okay. make, a, I would make the motion of intent to adopt uh, the resolution, to, to adopt a resolution as no, an intent. No, the, no. the adopted development agreement. To adopt. Okay. 
Sorry. Uh, it's just a motion of intent to improve the extension agreement. To approve the extension agreement. That's all it is. Okay. I'll try this again. All right. I'll make a motion of intent to approve the extension agreement. Okay. Mrs. As read by staff. No. That's it. That's, That's it. it. Mrs. Lewis? I'll second the motion. Okay. Now that we've got that down, uh, a motion of intent to approve the extension of the agreement and stated by Faria, second by Lewis. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? None carried. Now, Mr. Friel, let's go on to ordinance number 1129. Uh, now this should get easier. <laughs> I'll move to waive the first reading of ordinance number 1129 as read by title. Okay. Mrs. Lewis? Second the motion. Okay. Motion by Faria, second by Lewis to waive the first reading of ordinance number 1129. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? None carried. Okay. Let's go on to the introduction. Mr. Freya? I move to introduce ordinance number 1129 as read by title. Mrs. Lewis? Second. Motion by Faria, second by Lewis for the introduction of ordinance number 1129. Lucy, roll call vote, please. Faria? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Silvera? Yes. Stonegrove? Volalta? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, let's go on to item 9, Merced County Economic Development Presentation. And we'll go to Assistant Planner, uh, Planner Elves for a uh, introduction. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'd like to introduce from the Community and Economic Development Department of Merced County, Mark Hendrickson, who is the uh, director and the deputy director, Robert Lung. And they're going to be um, uh, doing a presentation for you tonight on the partnership uh, between the county and the six cities within Merced County uh, to encourage economic development. Thank you. Mark. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, good evening. I am so pleased that, uh, Stacy, I uh, identified my organization correctly. Just for the record, I am not with the county assessor's office. Um, but nonetheless, it is absolutely a privilege to be here. And before uh, we, we get to the presentation, um, you know, my hope tonight is for each of you um, to, to walk away um, w with an understanding that your city staff um, is working incredibly well. And I, I'll tell you, uh, having had an opportunity to work with a number of cities and jurisdictions uh, over the course of my career, uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, working with Mr. Kerrigan and with Ms. Elms some days on a daily basis. And so we are very blessed as an organization to uh, not only call them friends, uh, but to, uh, to work with them uh, in every respect. So I think we're going to... Okay, here we go. Um, so tonight's presentation, uh, we're going to kind of go back uh, a bit in time and give you a little bit of an update and an overview. Um, and when, when I speak of, of we, uh, that's, that's not the county of Merced. That's, that's literally you and us and each of the other cities as a part of, uh, a part of our collaborative effort. Tonight we're going to uh, give you a little bit of background where we started, kind of where we're at, where we're going. Kind of give you a few stats uh, here along the way. Again, all with the intention of, of showing and demonstrating um, that the, the cities uh, and the county are doing economic development better uh, with the intention of competing more effectively than we ever have. As you may recall, uh, in this city, uh, I, I believe, was instrumental. Um, and uh, Mr. Silvera uh, and I uh, was, was in Washington, D.C. as a part of a, a one-voice trip maybe a year or two ago where we actually sat down with the Economic Development Administration. And as you can see from the slide, um, one of, the, of, our, of our first goals was actually to, uh, to move forward uh, with, with really development of an economic development strategy as a part of what is referred to as a comprehensive economic development strategy update. We'll talk about that more here in a second. Uh, that's one thing we did. Uh, two, you know, we have moved forward with really a, a development of, a, of an attraction model. And three, again, going back to that team uh, concept I spoke of earlier, uh, we now have formalized a, a team uh, approach uh, that consists of each of the respective six cities as well as the county percent. Um, you know, is this, and this is just a, just a, a, a quick example of who we now bring around the table. And, you know, the picture is, is none other than just to, to show that, you know, we do work with our, with our city partners, and those are some of our friends from, from the city of, of Merced. And at some point, I've got to get a picture with Steve and Stacy to put up there as well. Um, but each of our, uh, each of our six cities, um, as well as our workforce development partners, our educational institutions, and our utilities, each of these folks are a part of our collective team. And in order for us to, again, compete, effect compete effectively, these are the folks we have, as a result of the partnership we've developed, are now around the table as we try to promote um, our region for success. 
What we did early on, and this is again, uh, I have to give a great deal of credit to, um, to each of our, our partners, but uh, as a part of the process of really developing that strategy, we identified three key goals, one of which is to grow our economy, two, to make ourselves more competitive, and three, what can we do to develop our talent better here in this county? And we'll flush those out here in a little bit. You know, last year, and again, as, as you walk away tonight, you know, and I'm, I'm going here fairly quick, but I, I wanted to highlight that we, we as a team were able to, to achieve a, a few different things. Um, you know, first and foremost, these are no, no, no particular order. Um, again, each of the cities in the county uh, worked together and, and each of us adopted an MOU and established protocols. And protocols in terms of how do we respond to leads, how do we distribute leads, how do we, again, try to position ourselves better than we have in the past. Um, we were successful, and again, this is where I give you uh, as, as a policy-making body, as well as the others throughout the county, um, a, a great deal of, of credit. Uh, we did finalize the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy update, and it was approved by the Economic Development Administration this past December. And that's just, in all honesty, that's just code word for that, that gives us the ability to compete for economic development grants coming out of the federal government for infrastructure um, that each of our respective jurisdictions believe are important within their respective jurisdictions. We have uh, a new uh, marketing pitch packet that um, as we get leads and as, as each um, you know, give us sites uh, from which to forward that uh, we're, we're utilizing. Um, we did accomplish, um, you know, obviously our, our, our you know, action plan, which included things like, you know, ensuring that we as a region are being adequately represented at broker missions, trade shows, and interacting with site selectors. And we'll talk more about that here in a subsequent slide in terms of really what does that mean. But just to put it in perspective, you know, we as a, we as a collective team, um, got Merced County and each of our six cities out to, to 11 fairly significant markets that range everywhere from New York to, to Dallas. As a matter of fact, in about two weeks, I'm going to go back to Dallas on behalf of some of the work that we're doing. And, um, and that resulted in a number of face-to-face -face contacts. Um, but, you know, it, one thing I want to point out um, is, you know, the, the number 49. Um, responding to leads, we'll talk more about that again here in a second you know, in, in the slides. We responded to 49 leads as a collective group over the course of that year. And the one thing I would tell you, you know, has, has that resulted yet um, in, in any, any walk-off home run? I'm a baseball fan. We had a walk-off home run? Not yet. But i tell you one thing. You can't win if you don't compete. And the fact is, is we are responding at a faster clip, at a more efficient clip than ever before. Um, and that's, uh, again, a result of the hard work in many cases of, as a result of your, 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 your good staff. We do have some things that I think we can collectively point to as, as being, uh, you know, trending in the right direction. Clearly, unemployment's still too high, uh, but it is down as, as it relates to, uh, you know, to where we have been in the past, and we are seeing some, some jobs added, you know, countywide. Um, you know, it's going back a, a couple steps, again, talking about growing our economy, um, there's lots of different components to that. But, you know, what I really do want to focus on is the fact that, you know, we are working incredibly hard to not only expand, um, uh, you know, opportunities, bringing new people to the region, but we also understand that um, it is important for us to, to be mindful of, of, of the business that we do have and, and helping existing business grow. Um, we have launched, a, a, obviously, a marketing strategy, and, and we're going to do better, um, you know, here with, with that as well and, you know, with, with websites and, and whatnot that, again, are designed to put each of our six cities in the county on a broader global map. Developing our talent, uh, I, I will tell you, this is um, one of our um, critical, critical points uh, that we need to uh, to continue to, to make uh, significant strides with. Um, the, you know, currently, the number one site selector factor uh, when they are evaluating communities is how ready is the workforce for the jobs of tomorrow. So keep that in mind, and for that reason, it's important for us to have solid relationships with the Workforce Investment Board, with Merced College, um, et cetera, et cetera, those who are helping provide that training. So again, our residents, whether they're in the city of Los Banos or whether they are in the city of Livingston or anywhere in between, are ready to, to take on those jobs. 
you know, this is a uh, this is a set of numbers, and they're a little bit dated. And I understand our our partners with the Workforce Development Department are going to be coming out with their 13, 14 numbers here fairly soon. And I won't go through all of these, but you know, these are some of their their stats at their most uh, their most end of, their most recent end of your report. But what this really does show is that uh, and, and I know it's a, a little small, but the, you know, the first number they're just shy of about 50,000 uh, total visits to to various WorkNet facilities. Um, you know, you know, here in the in the county of Merced, and really what they do is they are providing um, a host of. I think our next slide will will show it. Just a meaningful list of services, um, so that again our residents are in a position to compete. Um, but also, um, and there's there's um, you know, a great deal of work that they do to help those who are displaced. You know. It, as, as we kind of you know transition here, this is something that that, that I am proud of. That, you know, the county of Merced for many years um, has a essentially a business counseling program uh, where we contracted with somebody uh, to provide a you know essentially a, a range of, of services to help primarily small business get off the ground. This past uh, this past year, um, you know, our board um, you know, we went in a slightly different direction to do the same type of things, but a little bit more uh, with a greater focus on what can we do to help you know, small business find even greater success. And we established a relationship with the Small Business Development Center. And these are just some, some current um, stats that, uh, that, that have taken place since July, which is essentially when the contract started. And these are, these are referrals that are coming from every corner of the county. Um, and these are at zero cost uh, to, to with business plan development. Um, and just here a few weeks ago, uh, you know, we do have a, as a county, we have a revolving loan fund. Uh, we just uh, extended a, a loan to a business to help retain uh, 15 jobs uh, within the community. And, you know, again, 15 jobs may not sound like a whole lot, uh, but 15 jobs in a community like ours in Merced County is very meaningful. You know, th this is one um, that, that really, really, um, um, I think is important, which is, again, going back to, you know, what can we do to make ourselves as competitive as we can? Um, I, I can tell you, you know, one of, the, one of the broker missions that I went to this past year was in New York. And I was meeting actually with a, with a site selector at, just across uh, over in New Jersey. And uh, he was very clear, you know, we're not coming to California variety of reasons, you know, poor regulatory climate, uh, the things that we are all very well aware of. But he says, you know what, we'll think about the Valley um, because you need to be, but you need to be branding yourself as the other California. We want to be uh, the best place and arguably a very difficult state from which to do business. And so we want to be more competitive and we're going to get there by doing a, a few different things. Uh, one, by having a better understanding of what our strengths and weaknesses are, but most certainly uh, what constraints we have from a real estate perspective. Um, what can we do to actually help make sites shovel ready uh, or location ready? What can we do to fast track projects? Um, and as a result of that, uh, some, some of those efforts, we've been more engaged with a, a host of different uh, organizations. Most notably, um, you know, we as a, as a team are, are represented now on the California Central Valley Economic Development Corporation, which is a lead source. Uh, we are interacting with site selectors, consultants, brokers differently and better than we have before. Marketing branding again, going back to uh, to to the my, my previous statement. Uh, you know, the reality is, is we here in this community, whether in Los Banos or whether in Atwater or any anywhere in between, we have much to be proud of. For for whatever reason, um, going back many many years, we have been plagued with a number of socioeconomic challenges: high unemployment, low wages, et cetera, et cetera. But I would argue those things need not define who we are. And that's uh, I, I believe that in my heart. We need to uh, to show um, the world that you know Merced County and we collectively um, are a place that uh, that uh, the business can and should take place. So we're working as a group to to actually brand ourselves better. We've done that through uh, through websites. We've developed brochures that highlight each of our respective communities. We've developed you know tools uh, that the broker community. Um, you know, utilize again. Mentioned the pitch pack, and we'll we'll show you that in a little, here in a little bit. Better uh, a better job with, uh, with regard to social media, 
And then one thing kind of at the tail end, um, you know, we have uh, Robert has done a, a, just a, a tremendous job developing a, a, a great deal of data that is meaningful to those people who are evaluating communities for consideration. Um, you know, again, this year, uh, just uh, just to put it in perspective, this is January 1 through really the end of February. Um, you know, we've done several broker missions already. Um, and just at this point in the year, again, last year we had 49. This year we're already to, to 22. So, um, you know, we're seeing, you know, fairly decent leads. Um, and, you know, hopefully that's a sign of the economy continuing to rebound. Um, but, uh, but we're very hopeful that those trends continue. I do want to highlight real quick, in order for us to do our job in terms of responding to leads, and we have a, a slide here in a second that's really going to show you that process, I really want to note it, it's really incumbent upon getting good information back from each of our cities. And I, I would tell you firsthand, uh, that's a result of, of, of Stacy Elms getting back to us typically within, within a couple minutes. Helps make do our jobs better. Uh, she's efficient. And uh, again, as a result of that, um, we are uh, doing our part collectively. You know, Robert uh, had a chance um, to, uh, to uh, in addition to, to doing you know, broker missions, you know, we do um, represent, um, obviously, the, the region as a part of the, the California Central Valley Economic Development Corporation efforts, go to Sacramento and actually advocate uh, for those things that, um, that would hopefully um, make doing business in California easier. Uh, this past year, just to highlight a few, uh, these are just a, a few of the things that, uh, that were discussed, everything from trying to help uh, those areas who have been plagued with chronic high unemployment uh, to, again, you know, what can we do to Um, okay, so you know, again, you, you've heard me mention kind of leads. You know, leads come from a variety of, of different sources, whether it's the governor's office or whether it's it's a um, you know CCVDC or directly from a, a, a site selector or a broker. Um, we've actually become pretty efficient, where we're actually turning those things around literally in probably just a few days. And typically, you know, they include um, a, just a great deal of information that's that's meaningful to those making. Um, site selection you know, decisions, demographic information, labor information, you know, who's achieved what degree at, at what school. Um, those are, are forwarded to cities uh, and typically you know, our cities help us identify respective sites within their community. Again, something as simple as we'll ship a, a quick email to Stacy. probably in two minutes we get a, a response back as to yes we have something or in many cases maybe we don't and that's okay too. You know, it's a, you know, we're trying to move at the speed of business. The, um, over the last, uh, last year or so, again, this is where I have to give Robert a great deal of credit, we now have an opportunity um, to, to leverage technology a bit. You know, every once in a while, a lead is very, very generic. It could be, you know, I want 100,000 square feet um, located next to a rail line, and that's all we know, you know, yeah. with certain zoning. Now we have the ability to actually type in those, those parameters, and it will spit out, you know, sites um, you know, for consideration from throughout the county based on the parameters that were set. And then typically, um, you know, we'll try to do some, some verifying as to whether or not those properties are even, even available. And that's where, again, our partnership with the city is, is very, very handy. Pitch packet uh, is, is something that we use with, with, every, uh, with every response to every lead that we get. Um, it's a, I think, a document that uh, is really beginning to set our county apart, um, you know, from everyone from everyone else. And what you, this really doesn't do it justice. But inside that star, you know, hopefully you can see, you know, Los Banos. Every city and every unincorporated community is reflected within that star. Again, trying to show that we are um, collectively moving forward as, as one unit. With with one quick tagline, which is, you know, we're trying to promote that. Uh, hey, you need to be doing business here. Uh, moving forward, we've got a, a great deal of, of work ahead of us. Uh, you know, again, just here in, in a couple of weeks, I'll be heading to, to Dallas. Um, but this is just to go. It just goes to show that um, you know our efforts are, are really intended on trying to market uh, you know our region uh, effectively uh, with those decision makers who are uh, who have clients looking to locate um, somewhere in the Western United States. 
Um, this is, uh, you know, just a, a quick snapshot. We do have a, a fairly good idea in terms of um, what type of industrial space do we have available. You know, this is, and this is where I've got to give this, this council um, and, and your staff a great deal of credit. This is, you know, this, you take a look at this slide, and I know the numbers are, are real small, and it's not really intended to go through the numbers, but um, the reality is, is, you know, in order for us to compete so that we can bring the Amazon type of facilities that our neighbors just down the road uh, have been very successful with, we need to have shovel-ready and titled sites that have the ability to attract um, economic development to this region. And this is where I have to give this council uh, and your city manager and staff a great deal of credit, which is why my organization remains incredibly excited uh, about the prospect of trying to do something along that line, where, again, we could put Merced County on the map, um, create an environment in which the private sector can be successful and hopefully uh, create meaningful work uh, employments, uh, employment and, and opportunities for um, residents, most notably those from the city of Los Banos. Um, so what do we need? Again, we need, we need industrial parks, uh, we need development, we need, um, we need more because in all honesty there just isn't much. That's the reality. Uh, in order for us to compete with larger areas, um, who typically have you know, more available space, we've got to do something different. That's why I think the, um, the creative partnership between the city, the county, um, and the private sector, kind of this public-private public partnership that we are all very familiar with, is vitally important for the future of, of the county of Merced um, and, uh, and I believe for the city of Los Banos. So I will shut up. And, uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have, but again, just want to close with thanking you uh, for this quick opportunity, uh, thanking you for the work that you do, thanking your staff uh, for <coughs> being just friends and partners in the process. So, Mr. Mayor, thank you, sir. Thank you. Mark, where were the 2,900 jobs added? And you'd mentioned a figure and, and uh, employment's down 2.2 percent. Th those are countywide statistics that uh -huh. we were able to gain from the uh, economic uh, from EDD um, and so we'll take a look at that type of information try to determine you know where you see some growth you know we have seen some growth obviously in the manufacturing uh -huh. sector just as an example and this is not obviously an you know an all-inclusive number but you know it, it, but it's a small example of where I think we're seeing some success you know we were able to successfully bring uh, an overhead crane manufacturer a couple years ago yeah, I think they were promising like 25 jobs after year mm -hmm. one. Well, the reality is that after year one, it was, you know, I think mm -hmm. the number was just shy of about 60. Again, walk-off home run? Mm -hmm. No, probably mm -hmm. not. Pretty strong single. So we are seeing some gains in, in manufacturing. Um, but, you know, of course, you know, we as, a, as, a, as an ag-based uh, economy, uh, most, you know, most certainly, um, I would suspect that we're going to see probably some gains prospectively uh, in, in food processing, obviously here on the west side, as some of the facilities continue to grow and, and reach new markets. Uh, I would suspect that we're going to see um, you know, more activity along that line as well. Clearly, uh, while we may be trending in the right direction, uh, you know, I think the last figures were still well into the double digits. We've got work to do, which is why projects like the one I just talked about are so, so important. Can EDD get us a breakdown as to, you know, where, where, where these jobs, where they're located, uh, what, what field they were yes, in? Yes, sir. Yeah, matter okay. of fact, I'd be more than happy to try to get that, and we can get that to Steve probably tomorrow morning. Yeah, I, I, yes, sir. I, I'm just curious. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Mrs. Lewis. Thank you. Um, Mark, thank you for yes, your presentation. It's very enlightening. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of us and most people, if you listen to the news, have heard that by 2020 um, in the United States, the, the big push is going to be in the dot-com and the high-tech industry. Uh, I also heard recently that uh, education-wise, um, China is one of the big areas where kids who may not go to a four-year institution are going to technology schools to gain that, uh, tech, that particular expertise so that they can move right into the jobs that our kids in, the, in this country need. Um, New York is the financial hub of the United States and California is the technology hub. Um, I have a son who happens to work for an organization who's done very well in recruiting kids, training them, and working with some of these industries in the Bay Area and placing them in jobs successfully. So it really behooves us to begin to move in that direction. 
and that's no disrespect to the other industries that we have in the valley here. But even with that, uh, the technology that um, the farming industry needs can also be enhanced through this. So um, it, it's, you know, putting, putting uh, uh, buildings on the ground and being ready for companies to move in is truly important. Uh, I saw that for years in the Bay Area where uh, developers were just building infrastructure and there was no one in it. And all of a sudden, boom, the buildings are filled up. So we're a good breeding ground for that. Um, it's a little bit cheaper to operate over here than in the Bay Area. So I'm, I'm really enthusiastic and glad to hear that you're working towards that and that you did mention that as, as a, a high priority for the Valley. Thank Madam, you. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, couldn't I agree with you more? Uh, you know, again, I think that uh, you know, going back to some of my earlier comments, we've got tremendous opportunities here in this region. And while, as, as we all are, are very well aware, uh, with any community, within any region, there are often naysayers who only want to highlight those things that are negative. And I think in all, with all due respect to those folks, we need champions, not critics. We need those folks that are willing to step up and realize that uh, we are a region that uh, is very worthy of those types of opportunities. And, and I do believe that we are, uh, uh, we are, uh, we are due our fair share. Yes, ma'am. And, and as a, uh, another side of encouragement, uh, this might be a good time for our, our junior college here in Los Banos as well as Merced to start looking at those areas and training their students. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kerrigan. <clears throat> Mark Robert, I want to thank you for coming out on a school night. I know you have children. Robert has a newborn at home. People don't know that, so I know we're taking time away. But thank you for coming out. I have had the chance to work with these guys for the last two years, and they do know what they're talking about. It's been a pleasure to work with you. And as you know, my background is in economic development, and yeah, I appreciate you not laughing at some of my ideas, um, but I know what you need more than anything is industrial development because you have the plan, you have the infrastructure, you're out there talking to all the right people. You just need more product to, to market or sell. So uh, we're hoping to deliver that, but in the meantime, keep doing exactly what you're doing. Uh, I get all the good reports from Stacy. We talk regularly, but these are two of our biggest champions at Merced County, and uh, we are lucky to have them uh, on the other side of the county fighting for us every day. So thank you very much. It does mean a lot to us. All right. Mr. Silvera? Yeah, just a, a couple comments. Thanks for coming out. And so the, those pitch packets, so every time you get one of those leads, you send you send that pitch packet out. Is that how that works? Correct. To the needs of, to the requirements of the lead. So, you know, again, as a lead comes in, sometimes they are they're fairly general where you have very little information sometimes they're a little bit more specific uh, but we will tailor that package depending upon the needs of the uh, the prospective business most of the time of which we have no idea who it is um, so yes quick quick answer uh, mr silver you, you're absolutely correct and so those are is, is that a a hard packet that you mail to them or is that something that you send them electronically both both we do I, I just what i think why i think it's such a great idea is you know, I don't know whose hands that goes. Is that, is that a site select or someone, uh, you know, a, a consulting firm that they hired to have them go find it? By give, leaving them with something, maybe it doesn't work out on this one, but maybe they see something in there that, man, I, already, I, I got one already for the next time that, you know, I know will work. When you, some, so I think that's just Correct. a really great idea. Yes, sir. You know, the only thing I would say, and I did not highlight, highlight this in my presentation, and I, and I apologize for that. Uh, you know, a site selector's role, uh, their whole job in the world is to exclude a community, you know, from consideration, not include a community for consideration. The objective of the pitch packet is to step, uh, help us uh, kind of step outside the box, show that we're capable of meeting their needs, um, and hopefully when it's all said and done, get ourselves into a position where, you know, where we're shortlisted. And, you know, again, you know, the county, uh, my organization has taken an approach that if a job is created in the city of Los Banos or a job is created in pick an unincorporated community, it's a win for the people of the county Merced. Yeah. Thank you. And then my last is just a comment is, is I really do like hearing the talk of I'm, I'm so I get a little bit frustrated. I, I, I don't want us to ever like the comparison from the east side to the west side. You know, there's Castle on the east side, and we're talking about an industrial park <laughs> over here on the west side. To me, the talk needs to be in conjunction with each other. How, instead of this, and I'm not saying it's you, I'm saying sometimes you hear people out there and they're talking east side, west side. What I say is we need to find ways to, where those, those you know, they help each other. They make each other, they work together, they look good together. They, 
thank you is the word I was they complement each other. So I, I'm glad to hear you guys over there talking about that because I think that's, you know, we need to go down this road together. We all, because you're right, it, you know, this industrial park, you know, at build out, we, we're talking 10,000 plus jobs. That's not going to just benefit Las Banas. That's going to benefit the whole county. And, and quite honestly, it may benefit some of, you know, Fresno County is not that far up the road from us. There, there could actually, there'll be people that live in, on the outskirts of Fresno County that could be working there. So it benefits our whole area. So at least if our own house, we, we could all be pulling in the same direction. It just benefits everybody and it benefits this valley. So I just want to compliment you guys on the work that you're doing and keep up the good work and, you know, at least we're in the game. That's it. Yes, know, we didn't we didn't hit home run. Maybe game walk off home run, like you said. But you got to be in it to win it, right? So that's, exactly that's right. where we're at right now. So yes, sir. And, and and I completely agree with you on our staff and and the level. I mean, I know the city manager sends us a weekly report, kind of going over some highlights for the week every week. And and I don't think I've missed one yet that there's not that meeting with community and economic development staff so um they're doing a great job there and you know we're going to find that diamond in the rough i'm, I'm sure of it and, and we will get that walk off home run there you go yes thank sir you guys thank you mr freer uh thank you for coming out yes sir all the hard work we very much appreciate it if that business part comes to fruition we'll yes be, sir we'll that'll that that'll be more than a walk off home run i would that, think that'd be a grand slam yeah i would think thanks for coming yes out. sir my privilege and, you know, I just want to echo in, in, in part what everyone else has said. We want to complement each other. And this is Merced County. We want to make sure that the jobs, if, if possible, come to Merced County. And this business park uh, is, is important because it's going to complement in one way or another another project uh, that's located in another part of the county. We all need to work together. And in the process, the county will benefit from the sales tax that's produced, and so will the city of Los Banos. And that way the county sales tax can be shared with the rest of the county. It's important to note that, again, not an east side, west side project. It's how can two projects work together. And this project is wonderful because Los Banos is the only location in the county right off of uh, I-5. So uh, thank you for all your help yes, and keep pushing this forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, again, thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Let's go on to item 10, police department update and presentation of 2014 crime stats. Police Chief Rizzi. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Kind of uh, on a side note, I like that branding idea of calling us the other California. That's that's unique and uh, right up our alley, I think. Go ahead, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight this uh, look back at 2014. We are just one of a number of departments within the city that <coughs> are uh, proud to provide a service to the residents of our community. And uh, we think we do a, a fairly decent job of of that. Um, my goal with the presenta presentation tonight is threefold. I want to look back at the year in review, 2014, provide you some statistics, our part one statistics, our uniform crime report statistics. And then third, I'd like to talk a little bit about the benefits of being involved as, as a citizen of our community. First, we'll talk a little bit about the budget, just so that we can inform the general public of uh, what we um, what we monetarily have in, in order to, to do our job. $6.7 million in the general fund, augmented by about $1.9 million in other special revenues that include Measure P, A, and K that the residents of this community were so graciously uh, afforded us with. Homeland Security, SLEF, CFDs, Community Facilities Districts, JAG grant and some other funds. For a total operating budget, the police department at $8.6 million. Staffing, the staffing, the next two slides are really important to me. Authorized by the budget through the approval process that you all go through every year, the police department has 61 authorized staff members. 39 of those are sworn police officers. Currently, 
of those 39 authorized, we have 36. Uh, and we are in the process of hiring hopefully three trainees who will attend a, a, a police academy in June in Morgan Hill to bring us back up to 39. Um, and just a breakdown, because everyone always says, well, you've got 40 cops or 30 cops. Where do they all go all the time? Well, 23 of them are on patrol, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have four detectives, three administrators, myself and two commanders, three school resource officers under contract with both the school district and the Merced County Office of Education. Sergeant Seha is assigned to code enforcement. Officer Noah Jones is our PAL officer, and we have one officer assigned to the Merced multi-narcotic, I'm sorry, multi-agency narcotics task force. On the non-sworn side, we have 10 dispatchers, five CSOs who run our jail, two code enforcement officers, one police services manager. That's our non-sworn manager of a majority of the staff that are on that right column. Custodian, property evidence, a crime analyst, and then a admin clerk for code enforcement which brings us to two, uh, excuse me, 22 total non-sworn or 58 total employees. To provide some perspective and a look back at some of the staffing issues that we deal with almost on a daily basis with the Human Resources Department hand in hand with us um, is recruitment and retention of police officers. What we did for the purposes of this presentation was I went back and literally looked at the First step was I looked at the picture of the police department back in 1996. And I went through and I tried to determine who was still here, who wasn't, who retired, and who left for another agency. Through that process of looking back at rosters, other uh, police department annual photos, we came up with a short list of 43 police officers that have been recruited by the police department, hired for a length of time, and left for one reason or another. 35 of those 43 left for another agency. Eight of those officers we recruited, but we did not retain. That right column is an example of, or breakdown of who we lost those officers to. We lost four each to the Las Gatas Police Department, Merced Police Department, Merced Sheriff's Department. We've lost three to Redwood City PD, Two to Turlock, Fresno, Department of Justice, City of Modesto, City of Tracy, and one to each of the UC system and the CSU system. And then we lost one officer to each of those other agencies, Salinas, Hollister, Mountain View, Santa Maria, Reading, Ceres. We lost an officer to the country of Australia and the state of Illinois. Uh, the, the officer from Australia came back to visit not too long ago, and uh, it sounds like a different world over in Australia compared to what we do. So nonetheless, we spend a lot of time recruiting and going through the process of hiring police officers. And again, this is just a snapshot of the sworn staff. Uh, we have other staffing um, needs that we go through a lot because a lot of times our CSOs often become our police officers. Um, part-time receptionists become dispatchers or CSOs. So there's a lot of fluidity in the department because people are always trying to better themselves. The unintended consequence of that is the uh, considerable amount of time and resource that we put towards hiring and maintaining those employees. Just a real quick breakdown of some numbers of patrol operations. Again, 23 officers provide that 24-hour a day service. In 2014, they generated over 26,000 reports of one form or another. That's an increase over 2013 of about 1,588. I'm happy to report that there were no fatalities, traffic-related fatalities in 2014, even though our citations went down about 400. Um, and one of my usual indicators of accidents to citations is, is where I try to see if I have more accidents, I need to write more tickets because we're trying to change people's behavior. In this case, and actually statistically over the past several years, the less citations we've written has kind of coincided with less traffic accidents. The more citations that we've written equated to more uh, traffic accidents in our looking back at the stats, which was unusual for me because I would have thought the exact opposite would happen. But I'm glad to report that this year we're down in traffic accidents. Our uh, adult arrests are up 
1,249, and we had 103 DUI arrests. Both those categories are up. Our special services units is the overall name of our detectives, gang unit, traffic unit, and we have four officers assigned to that currently, three detectives and one detective sergeant. They worked over 500 cases in 2014 and served over 50, served 52 search or arrest warrants. The reality of our circumstance, however, is the, the next part where I say, unfortunately, the staffing does not allow us to have a full-time two-person street crimes unit or a full-time two-person traffic unit. As uh, Mark mentioned in his presentation from the county, we were doing really good for a time. In 2008, we had both of those teams together. We still have the two motorcycles, and we get them out as often as we can on overtime, but they're dedicated to that patrol effort currently because we just don't have the staffing to do that full time. I'll tell you, the number one complaint, well, I'll say number one A is traffic, and number one B is code enforcement complaints for uh, the police department currently. And uh, we do our darndest to keep traffic um, at the top of our list. So the moment we can, we're going to put people back into that gang enforcement unit. We're going to put people back into that traffic enforcement unit as dedicated bodies where all they do is go out and um, contact gang members <coughs> and people's driving behavior safe. If I'm going too fast, please stop me and ask a question at any point in time. I don't mind. Code enforcement, we've had the code enforcement department uh, division now um, since I believe March of last year. They responded to over 800 calls. They tagged 172 vehicles on private property. That's quite a few for the two people that we've got, two code enforcement officers. One of them is assigned to animal control, and his day is full doing animal control, which we'll talk about in a moment. They issued the three of them. Jason, uh, Tammy, and Jesse issued 174 administrative citations for violations of our municipal code. Um, and we've talked about this before, but code enforcement is broken into those two different divisions, community preservation and then animal control. Animal control is always busy. They responded to 2,938 calls, which is up from last year. Jason Martin, our animal control officer, our code enforcement animal control officer, alone responded to over 1,000 calls this year where he generated a report of some type. That's a lot of calls for one man to do when you consider all of the other duties that he has at the shelter with the volunteers. Um, I, I love that guy. He does a great job for us. We impounded 2,398 animals, which is actually down from last year, but our save rate, and this is thanks to our volunteers. I really appreciate the proclamation you gave today to our animal control volunteers and our vital volunteers. Without a doubt, that save rate of 80%, 1,919 animals this year, is attributed directly to the efforts of our animal control volunteers. They do an outstanding job, and we would not be able to achieve that number without them, hands down, without a doubt. So I really appreciate their efforts. Dispatch Center. Um, boy, we saw an unusual increase in the number of telephone calls answered by dispatch this year, this year, 2014. Almost 48,000 times did we pick up that phone and say, Los Angeles Police Department. That's up, i got to do the math, it's up about 12,000, if I'm doing the math right, from 35,000 calls last year. That is a tremendous increase. Of those 47,000 calls, 16,000 of them were 911 calls. That is an increase from last year, I'm sorry, 2013, 9,566. And I'm going to go back through and recap all these in one of the slides you'll see here soon. We attribute many of those calls, the 911 calls, to the fact that we have, over the last two years, migrated from Cellular, li cellular line, 911 calls going to the Highway Patrol office, we get them all now. Um, it's a really neat system. We get GPS coordinates, um, and we can tell where people are at if they can't give us the, their location. They, it pops up on a map. We can direct our units to uh, that location rather easily now. But that increase in calls from 9,566 in 2013 to over 16,000 in one year is a tremendous effort by our dispatchers. Hands down, the hardest grouping, hardest working group of dispatchers in the valley. The jail, 
The jail has gone down as far as the number of people that we've booked over the years because when the uh, tough times hit, I made the decision of not booking for agencies that were not willing to pay us. Um, I think you're going to see that that's going to increase because slowly more agencies are coming back. They're willing to pay the fee to book at our jail because the sheriff's department, for example, would have to take a person that they've arrested in Santa Anella all the way back to Merced in order to, to book them um, because they weren't able to book at our facility for a time. That takes that deputy out of the Santa Anella area for hours because you don't just get into the Merced jail and book within 10 or 15 minutes. You're there for sometimes hours in line waiting to book with other agencies. But for 2014, we booked 1,496 adults. That's up from 2013. Our booking numbers alone were for adults was 1,249. That's also an increase. And again, I will, I'll show you a little a much more concise breakdown of those statistics here in the next couple slides. PAL is another one of our shining stars at the department, run by Officer Noah Jones. It is um, probably the best PAL organization in Merced County. I, I would dare say the region because for what we have as far as staffing that we put towards this program, he knocks it out of the park all the time. The numbers have gone up this year as compared to last year. You can see the, the activities that PAL provides, girls softball, junior giants baseball, flag football, cops for kids, and sober graduation. It's the police department's one positive activity that we can provide for this community on a regular, consistent basis. We do as much outreach as we can in the form of intervention and prevention techniques to get people out of crime, prevent them from getting into crime, but this has been a consistent standard for us for a number of years. Uh, it puts NOAA, it puts other officers in the field coaching some of these teams. I've been a coach for PAL in the past. I have a blast, as have other people. So PAL has been a, uh, a great asset to the department. Okay, so this is that recap of those numbers. I just wanted to go over because of the swiftness that I have provided you with the numbers initially. There were only four categories where we saw a decrease in numbers. And in one of the categories, the total, the traffic fatalities, we're glad to see that number go down. And we're uh, always happy when it does. Citations, like I mentioned, it did go down, but as did our traffic accidents. And the number of animals impounded slowly is starting to get better. We talk about spay and neuter programs. The city offers one of a discount state spay and neuter program. The animal control volunteers offer a spay and neuter program. We don't officially have a TNR program, trap neuter release program in the city, but our volunteers are very active in capturing feral cats. They get them spayed or neutered, and then they take them out to local dairies, and um, we have a, agreements with local dairies where we let them loose and the cats are mice catchers. So there isn't an official program because a lot of times it's a funding issue that we can't afford to spay and neuter the animals as often as we're getting them, but we're doing absolutely everything we can when we can with the programs that we can. Again, I think the, the couple that I would like to highlight in this recap of the numbers is that 911 called answered by our dispatchers. That went up in one year 6,549 calls. That's an incredible number in just one year of an increase, as is the total number of telephone calls that they answered, going up by almost, uh, almost 13,000. The st statistics, so our part one crimes are the major crimes that we report to the state and the federal government every year. We released the numbers um, locally here the other day, but <coughs> to recap, we saw a 11.87% decrease in crime as compared to 2013. If you consider the fact, and I'm super superstitious, so I try not to say it too much, but if you consider the fact that between 2012 and 2013, we saw a decrease of almost 14%, that puts us in excess of a 25% decrease in crime over the last two years. Um, Man, that is a good number. That is a hard-working number, a hard-fought number. 
that requires the assistance of the community our residents that we're going to talk about here in a moment but we've been able to achieve without anything other than our efforts in the field and, and with the community a 25 almost 26 percent decrease in crime in the last two years so I'm celebrating that for this very small moment because like I said I'm superstitious I don't want to say it anymore um, and I also will say that Proposition 47 is, um, has changed the game for uh, California. It's yet to be seen what the total difference or change will be. It's too early to tell. But what Prop 47 basically did was take a number of felony crimes and turn them into misdemeanors. So a good example would be possession of a controlled substance, methamphetamine, rohypnol, um, there's a lot of those drugs now that went heroin from a felony for possession to a misdemeanor. So instead of a trip to jail and uh, you see a judge in court, try and get some help for you, we write you a ticket. And uh, that's, gonna be a, that's gonna be a game changer. Property crimes now, um, and I have another presentation that I'm gonna do on um, Prop 47, but property crimes now, generally it used to be $400 threshold to be a felony. It's now $950. Um, we've seen across the state um, people taking items from local businesses where they stay under that number so that they know if they get caught, they're, um, they're only being charged with a misdemeanor. And that is very frustrating because it ties one of our hands behind our back to do the job. Chief, I think California sees the, uh, the state legislature sees the same thing, and now they're trying to some of the legislators are trying to react by passing bills to counteract 47 yes. Yes. that the citizens voted in. Yes. And so, so this merry-go-round goes on and on yeah. and on. Someone votes something in, and then the legislators, uh, you know, try to make a few points by uh, by by counteracting what what was enacted. And so, who loses? The citizens of yeah. every community Absolutely. in the state of California and their police departments. Yeah. So Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Freed, do you have a comment? Uh, does the, on meth and heroin, is there a threshold at which it becomes a felony or is it for possession? For different crimes. Um, different items. Perhaps manufacturing of those drugs. But just a, possession? Yeah, mere possession is. No, no matter how much the possession is? No, no, I think there's a, there is a, there is a threshold, I believe, where oh. it becomes a felony. Transportation. Okay. All right. Um, and trans you could be walking down the street with six pounds of meth. You're going to get yeah, that's with uh, that. that. But I'm talking yeah. mere possession. The user end of it, those uh -huh. people that we're trying to affect change on because they're generally caught in a cycle when they're using those drugs. They need to sustain their habit. In order to do that, they generally get involved with other crimes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Thanks. They steal things. So um, we will enjoy that 25.79% number. We are going to work as hard as we can to keep that number down. Um, the good part, the last time I looked at the Merced County Registrar Voters Office, and it's been a few months now, Proposition 47 was actually the majority of people in Merced County actually voted against Prop 47, interestingly enough. So what can a normal citizen do to help us lower crime? Well, there's a few things. First one is you can become a police volunteer like you stated earlier. There is nothing better than having people interact with law enforcement on a daily basis. Nothing changes the perception of perhaps the us versus them mentality than seeing the things that we do every day because it really humanizes the men and women that I work with every day who are trying to do a very tough job, make decisions in an instant, um, only to be second-guessed by the media most times um, inappropriately. So there's nothing better than to get them inside our department working with us to see that 99.9% .9 of the people that I work with up and down the state are great people trying to do the best for their community. So becoming a volunteer is important. Let's talk about the volunteers real quick. And we, the mayor mentioned it in his proclamation. There's about 25 vital volunteers. And I want to go back on one of the numbers that code enforcement did. I believe it was uh, 172 vehicles that they tagged on private property. Uh, to help beautify our neighborhoods, the volunteers tagged 85 
vehicles themselves on the public right of way that is 257 vehicles that they moved from either a front yard a driveway grass or your next door neighbor's um, sidewalk or, or portion of the roadway in front of the driveway or I'm sorry in front of the sidewalk I know that doesn't mean a lot to some people but to me when you are in charge of code enforcement the fact that we're keeping those people moving those cars 257 is quite a bit so I really appreciate their efforts the volunteers for animals like I discussed over 5,500 hours this year in volunteer service to this community they do a great job and like I mentioned we would not have the save rate that we have we wouldn't be getting out animals uh, to adoption owner um, not owner releases but getting uh, owners to reclaim their dogs or getting them adopted or fostered out without their efforts and they go up and down the state in fact there was an article that uh, talked about I don't know where it was but there's an article about a, a group of people that own planes that were flying animals up and down the state of California our volunteers have, a par have participated in events like that have participated in um, fostering out and adopting out animals up and down the state of California with other states because they will go to the end of the earth to make sure these dogs are saved okay so I want to go back to um, what some of the people in this community can do to help us solve crime help us to reduce crime I've got three examples that I want to talk about really quick the first one is an armed robbery in a thousand block of Pacheco Boulevard on January 31st two men armed with firearms enter a business um, rob the business at gunpoint as they leave a citizen flags down one of the arriving officers to tell them the vehicle description of the vehicle that the uh, suspects drove away in the officers are able to identify the car find it and uh, apprehend the suspects after a pursuit generally when things are going on with like a crime like an armed robbery that's a pretty violent crime there are people going in every direction people are scared but this citizen took a moment to flag down the officer and say it was a blue Ford Tempo and it went that way that was all we needed in this case to find the car we got into a pursuit with it they ran away once they got into a court but we captured them had they not taken that two seconds to say it was a blue car and it went that direction we probably wouldn't have caught them that night and who knows if we would have ever caught them but that's how easy it is all you have to do is go it was a blue car and it went that way I'm out of here see you later that's all we needed in that case so that's just one example second example is a burglary in progress August 17 2014 100 block of West J a concerned neighbor goes to his um, apartment compact complexes laundry um, area and finds that a guy is breaking into one of the coin operated machines some people would rather not get involved some people would just look the other way and say I didn't see anything because they're scared they're scared of calling the police they're scared of being confronted by the suspect there's a lot of reason they don't call us but in this particular case this person called us and said there's a guy breaking into a coin operated uh, laundry machine we get there she says it's right over there I'll see you later our guys catch this guy red-handed in the act of breaking into this machine it was an easy act it was an easy two seconds of their time to call us wait and be part of the process of catching these guys because they need to get off the street they're damaging our friends and neighbors property maybe it's a drug doesn't matter but they are a nuisance and to our community and they need to get off the street and that's how easy it is so I encourage everyone that's listening that's watching take the two seconds call 911 call the business line the dispatchers are trained to say what is your name where are you calling from what's your callback number you can ask to remain anonymous and they'll respect that and that's all you need just simple facts like that example number three marijuana grows boy our narcotics task force agent has been really busy this year in 2014 um, I'm just going to show you a couple um, or one example over the over the year he served seven search warrants at homes in Los Banos that were found to be illegal marijuana grows based on citizen tips you and your neighbors get tired of these people who are in and out at all 
odd hours of the night. Uh, they're criminals most of the time that are associated with these grows. They make unusual noises when you're trying to sleep. They bother you with weird smells because they're using chemicals and fertilizers and they're using electricity. Um, but people get tired of it, so they call the police. And in seven of those cases, we served search warrants. We found over 2,000 plants, six pounds of processed marijuana. And equally important is the fact that each and every one of those grows had illegally obtained PG&E. So what they're doing is they're getting PG&E. They have a bill. They have a, um, a contract with PG&E. Energy's flown into the house, but they're bypassing the meter. The wiring is hot. And these guys are putting these things together in ways that we shouldn't be doing. So it causes dangers to the house, the property owner, their neighbors. Uh, there are a number of reasons why these things are just a bad deal. And all of those cases started with phone calls to either myself or the police department just to report that there's weird activity at odd hours of the night. There's nobody home. There's aluminum foil on the windows. You name it takes one phone call, two minutes of your time, and these are the results that we get. Um, we're often asked, often asked about a neighborhood watch, and the process with neighborhood watch is really, we go in as the police department and facilitate that initial meeting and get the ball rolling with the neighborhood. But it is up to the neighbors in that particular area to follow through and keep that process going. The good part about that is you don't have to have a formal neighborhood watch to meet the needs of what a neighborhood watch is. If you know your neighbors, you know their names, you know their phone numbers, you know their kids' names, you know what they do. If you call each other and say, I'm leaving for the weekend, watch my house. Um, you call and say, hey, I saw this weird delivery truck. Is it uh, supposed to be there? Congratulations, you have a neighborhood watch. And that meets the need. But if you're interested, myself, Megan, one of the other commanders, will come out and talk to you about starting a neighborhood watch. Okay, the last slide that I have um, talks about being a aware citizen. We did this last year in our, our presentation, and I thought it was pretty powerful. I'm going to do it again. We had 607 thefts, larcenies, from, uh, reported in Los Banos. Those are the basic minor thefts that go on. 129 of those were from a vehicle. If you take the basic steps of removing your valuables from your vehicle, lock your doors, park in a parking lot that's well lit or in a, that portion of the parking lot that's well lit, you take a few minor steps to improve your chances of not becoming a victim, our crime stats go down 129 by itself. And they're very easy steps to take. To accomplish that goal but to this day I could go look right now people leave their doors unlocked they leave their iPads their computers their wallets their cell phones in their cars <coughs> in the darkest part of a parking lot and it gets stolen nothing <laughs> infuriates me more because it could have been avoided and now people are out of their money their valuables they're subject to being a victim of identity theft and identity theft is terribly hard for us to to solve at a local level. So take the easy steps of locking your doors, rolling up your windows, and keeping your valuables out of sight. And that concludes my presentation, and I would be happy to ans answer any questions that you may have of me. I will tell you that neighborhood watch is the great equalizer. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to live in a neighborhood where you think all the neighbors are concerned about each other's homes. You have to live in a neighborhood where people can band together and, uh, and, and work together. Uh, it is a great equalizer to reducing crime in the city of Los Banos. And I can't push for that enough, and I can't push enough for the vital volunteers and uh, friends of the animals to uh, if people have extra time to start volunteering their time uh, for those two activities. It can help us immensely. It can stretch the arm of law enforcement to a point that we can reduce these numbers even more. Citizens are helping to reduce this number, 
And I have to tell you, as far as code enforcement is concerned, the numbers are up because the numbers are up. And that, by that statement, I mean people are seeing results from code enforcement, so they're calling more. And they're asking for services because they don't want to put up with the ill-kept yards. They don't want to put up with the abandoned cars. And, and they surely don't want to put up with a neighborhood that looks trashy. So <coughs> call for services. You will find out that if you start calling for these services, the people that are 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 making your neighborhoods trashy are going to stop because those citations get worse and worse. And believe me, no one wants to continue to pay those citations. People are misbehaving, call. The police department will do something about it. Now, if they're not hit there in a few minutes, don't think that they're ignoring you because there may be more pressing calls that are coming up at the time. But Neighborhood Watch is a great equalizer and having more police volunteers. You can't believe how much that works. Mrs. Lewis. Thank you. Uh, Chief, thank you for this report. And you know, when I look back at the traffic fatality for 2013 and 14, um, to me it kind of directly correlates with the fact that your officers gave out more citations in um, that year and behavior modification works. People start acting appropriately on the road. So thank you for making sure that they do that. Um, code enforcement. Um, and, you know, I just want to give a lot of compliments to Jason Martin. Uh, this young man has crossed over and handled two jobs uh, when he was hired for one. And he's done a remarkable amount of work uh, for our community to, uh, especially at the Animal Control Department, which is where he was hired to, to operate. But with that, would you say that we'd need another animal control officer in the city of Los Banos? Don't worry, no repercussions. <laughs> no, no, no. Answer the question. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, if you look back, and I can almost recite this verbatim, when you look back at 2008 when in the city was hustling and uh, homes were being built at a frantic pace and everything <coughs> looked great, um, we had two animal control officers. We had 10 more cops. We had more CSOs. We had more janitors. We had more dispatchers. And uh, we're a lean, mean finding machine, much like the other departments that I work with because of funding. But to answer your question, I, I certainly won't um, avoid it. But yeah, absolutely. I could use another animal control officer. Thank you. Hey, any other questions? Well, Chief, thank you. We really appreciate it. And. Uh, continue and, and let us know how we can continue to get the word out to get citizen help and, uh, and uh, neighborhood watch and whatever else we can do. Thank you. Yeah, I will say a, a real quick uh, word about social media. We're, we're out there a lot trying to do as best we can as much as we can. So social media is, a, is a, the new wave of getting the word out as quickly as you can, and we're trying to be as, uh, as open to it as we can. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay, should have taken a break a while back, but we're almost done, so uh, let's go on to item number 11, advisement of public notices. Uh, Assistant Planner Alms. Yes, we have one um, public hearing notice. Uh, it's a proposed ordinance for farmers markets. Currently, we don't have any policy or regulations in the farmers market season. will be coming um, up upon us very shortly. So uh, this will be going before the Planning Commission on Wednesday, April 22nd at 7 p.m. here in the Council Chambers. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. It's my understanding that, Mr. Silvera, your request will be on the next meeting. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, let's go on to city manager's report, item number 12. Thank you, Mary. I have a couple of quick ones. Um, I want to thank uh, Public Works Department, uh, Butch Terranova. He allowed me to go on uh, his shutoff tour last week. If you don't pay your water bill, we do shut you off, and I had never been a part of that process, so I asked Butch if I could tag along with him, and 
we shut about 10 or 12 people off and they brought me back to City Hall. Um, but I want to thank him. It was, it was quite an experience. Um, I want to talk a little just, we've been talking drought a lot, and I'm going to send it over to Mark Fajan here in a moment just for a couple quick comments because we had a nice conversation today, and I asked him if he would speak tonight just for a moment. But about a week ago, Mark Fajan, our public works director, and our assistant public works director, Greg Pimentel, sat in my office for about 90 minutes, and we talked about uh, water conservation and outreach and things we're going to do. And it re it's really pretty clear there's four parties that are involved in this, the city of Los Banos, the school district, the residents, and then the top 10 or 15 water users in town, the commercial water users. And Mark's got a plan to reach out to all those guys. Um, they've, they've really thought this through. Um, we do have to reach 35%, not 25%, because we're in what's called Tier 4. Uh, we didn't meet our numbers in 2013, so we're, we're in Tier 4, which is 35%. Um, one thing I want to steal a little Mark's thunder is on May 4th, uh, the Public Works Department, that week of May, not May 4th, the week of May 11th, uh, the Public Works Department will be out and about knocking on all doors and putting flyers on doors and, uh, you know, talking to them about the drought, and that'll be your one warning. So uh, we are going to get out there. Um, we're going to cite some people. We're taking a little harder approach than we have in the last year, and it's not that we want to be bad guys. It's just uh, people really need to pay attention. And out of the four groups that I mentioned, the city, the school district, the residents, and the water users, it's really about the residents. And Mark and I did have a nice talk today. Mark, if you could take a couple of minutes to just explain a few, some of the things you found out in your course of research and a few of the things that I did not mention, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Well, number one is thank you. Um, the city is in tier four, which is the most, the 25% man, mandate is statewide. And they go by individual cities to see what you have to do. We're in tier four, which is 35% which really isn't based on the savings from last year, although we only did 7% savings last year. We did have savings. It's based on their numbers of per capita use, so how much water is used per person. We don't necessarily agree with the numbers that they calculated. We're trying to talk to them, but the best we could do is to Tier 3. So we, we, are, we have to do a 35% goal. But let me give you some idea, which is very interesting, is single-family residents use 67% of the water that we produce. Multifamily residents use 5%. That's 70% of the water is used by residents, the residential community. Landscaping, which is all meters that are landscaped, all landscape meters that are red, school district, the city, businesses, anyone that has a separate landscaping meter, is 8% of the total water. So to give you some idea what that is, if only the landscaping portion conserves 35%, citywide that's a 3% gain. If only the single or the homes, the residential, saves 35 percent, that's a 30 percent gain over the city. Everyone has to do their part, but it's very obvious that the single family residents really have to do their part. What we're doing on a citywide basis, we are, we are down to watering our, our parks two days a week during only watering hours. Uh, our goal is to keep them, they will be dry, but to keep them alive so they revitalize. It's a very important part of our infrastructure. We met with the school district, um, and they're working with us on the 35% reduction. Something that's to be noted is several of their facilities are on private wells, which are not part of this mandate. They are going to try to conserve the water in there also. Uh, the Las Banas football field, that is on a private well, so it might look a little greener than some of the other areas they do, but they, they are going to mandate the 35% as much as possible in other areas. So what we're doing now with the single-family residents, we're at the point now where we are not warning people anymore. We have changed our flyers and the warnings have been removed. The state's had a personal call with me about this, that how many tickets did you give out last year, uh, violations, and I said lots of warnings. He said, what was the amount of your violations? And I said, uh, zero. That didn't go down well considering we didn't meet our goal. But regardless of that, our fines are still very low. It's not, a, it's not a, it's, we're at $15, I believe, to start off with. Most cities start off at 100 it's not, the object isn't to, to make money or to recoup money from conservation efforts. The object is to get people to wake up a little bit and let them talk to their neighbors about how bad public works was. They gave them a fine and maybe the neighbors will go through and people will start doing that. We definitely have, um, there, is, there is definitely people in town that are conserving quite a bit and there's some people that are not at all. So. Right now, we still look at who, who we've warned, but if it's, a gross if it's a gross negligence of things that have been 
Some of these things have been in for years. If it's a gross negligence, the, the fines are going. After the May 11th, that week, when we walk to each individual resident and hand them, that will be the one warning for the entire city. So we will not, we will actually, re, our program will not have any more warnings after that point. We just, we can't warn and fine with the same staff we have. We're only having one, one and a half people do this. So it's, it's kind of rough. In the meantime, though, the inside, people have to still conserve water inside. We, we need 35% in the outside of residences and we need 35% inside. Full loads of watering, shut off the water when you're brushing your teeth. Just things that do not wash down hardscapes. That's a really important one. That's really bad. We, can, we have to stop our treated, our potable water going down our catch basins. We, that, that's, has, that's a major. Uh, we do not give administrative fines if water hits the gutter in front of someone's residence and doesn't go, doesn't leave that resident. That, that's just, sometimes that's a problem with the wind. Sometimes it's, that's a lot of problems that you can't get over. When it leaves a residence, we start looking at it very intently. And definitely if they're not doing it on the days, because there's three days that just, there's no watering at all. So those days are very easy to talk to people about because if there's water going on, they, it's not supposed to happen. So we will be concentrating a lot. All the areas are being dealt with. We're meeting with individual, the, we're meeting with the industrial users. A lot of their water's in their industrial process, um, and they already, they already have recycled a lot of water, but they've also been very successful in the last couple of years. So they're looking at ways to prevent waste in other areas than, the, than their industrial because that, in their actual product, because they're actually doing very well with their product, which equates to jobs, equates to economy. So this is where we're heading. So you will, you, I, no doubt you will be getting, we get them all the time. When the fines are started showing you, people will say something about it. But I think we get more calls now, why haven't you fined this person than we getting the opposite, so. So any questions, I'll gladly try to answer them. Mr. Silvera. So, Mark, the fine is, it starts out at fifteen one five dollars correct? Yes, sir. And then it progressively goes up from there. Yeah, it goes up to, uh, I have it here so I don't blow it like last time. Uh, microphone, mic. It goes to $30 and then to $75. So even on the third violation, we're still below almost every city. And so could you explain, and, and I, if I understand it correctly, and what I've read, we didn't issue many or any fines last year, and right. so the state now is, they're, they're, we're, we have to send them how much, we're, they, they're tracking how much we're fining people, correct? They're tracking, they knew how much that we were giving warnings, but now they want to know the fine too. Yes. And the, so if we're not, if we don't meet our compliance, what happens to the city of Las Banas? Well, it, there's a whole range of things, and, and they haven't said exactly what. It can go to a fine of $10,000 a month, but even more than that. And this is why uh, we have to find these, we have to start putting these administrative fines out with no warnings and, and start getting people to react because they can come in and they can mandate your water bills going up in price immediately. As a as a uh, you know we have a graduated tier, but a lot of cities have just doubled that or tripled that to start off. They can also come in and. Uh, Mandate it to find us five hundred dollars first time if you're not getting close. Thirty-five percent. Thirty-five percent. I'll be honest. I think it's going to be very, very difficult. But if we're in the high twenties to low thirties, we can deal with that a lot better than the seven percent we had last year. And that's really what we're aiming for. We're really, we're really going out hard. <coughs> Our people are working not just the work hours. We're getting them over at two o'clock in the morning, because what happens is people are cutting down to two days a week, but they're watering twice as often. Yeah, that totally defeats the purpose. They got to cut down that one day, don't, and then cut down their cycles. Also, it's both. Mark, our guys will also be out in the middle of the night. Can you talk about that for a little bit? Well, we're kind of depends on how many water breaks, but yes, we'll yeah. we'll have people out every now and then during the middle of the night, especially on no water days, especially on no water days. And we also have uh, going out at five in the morning because people tend to stop their watering at seven because that's when our staff gets on. The other thing we will do, we will have water patrol magnetic signs on the cars that are doing it, so it's a, it's a being out in the public. We'll, we'll be at the street fair. Thank you to Republic. They'll share their booth with us. It's very great. We'll be at the May Day Fair. Uh, thank you to Republic again and to the fire department and Ron Brandt. They're going to let us double up with the fire department and, and hand out brochures. So we're going to be out there, and we're trying to also get a flyer into this, all the school uh, children's hands before school's out, so it goes home. So we are we're doing a mass, but it's, it's it's interesting. One fine seems to get to like 50 people, 
and also thanks to Gary we did get on uh, social media we're not good at it they're very good at it so he took my uh, he took my uh, press release and stuck it on social media and we've gotten a lot of input from that <laughs> thank you um, and that's what we're doing for so we think we're advertising well uh, it's it's uh, just a matter of we're going to get a little uh, less green this summer for sure thank you all right any other questions <coughs> okay Let's go on to city council member reports. Tonight we'll start with Mr. Freya. Thanks, uh, Mayor. Um, let's see, the 72-hour prayer chain is Monday through Thursday next week. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, and that, and that where's that going to take place? That takes place at every house member in their homes. In the homes. Yeah. Okay, very good. So uh, praying for the city um, next week. Also, um, street fair Saturday. And then you have pony rides this year, too. It's going to be kind of exciting. Uh, we got our shovels ready, too, uh, for, for the ponies. We got some extra shovels for the ponies. Um, and then um, choir concert next week, Wednesday night, we're doing uh, Los Banos High School Choir is doing a spring concert featuring music from the Phantom of the Opera, Andrew Lloyd Whipper's Phantom of the Opera, lots of soloists, a lot of great music there. At St. Joseph's, $5 a person. Um, we appreciate community support. Come on down, have a have a wonderful time uh, listening to these kids saying they're quite good. And um, then um, finally, there's a new ice cream shop in town. And if you haven't tried it, uh, I I've tried it too many times, but you know it's very good. Uh, Surfs up there over on uh, on Pacheco Boulevard. So every time we get these new uh, new businesses coming in, uh, we try to support our local business and local families running these. Um, money that stays local stays local and it stays local in taxes it stays local in jobs so we want to support our local vendors and have a great week and let's see we we'll see won't see you again until after may day so have a great fair mrs lewis thank you mr mayor i have nothing to report this evening okay let's go on to mr silvera a few things first i want to say thank you to francisco and eric the two lone soldiers that that hung out through the whole meeting and are listening to all this valuable information that I hope you share with with your family and friends on on water conservation because I think it's it's so important and it's and it's it's going to be a team effort on everybody everybody has to do their I, I listen I'm I caught myself a few times and I've been telling myself you know every little bit helps every little bit helps and and you're right there are people out there conserving I have a neighbor of mine that she catches all of her bath water and she uses it to water stuff in her yard and, and you know so every every little bit helps so I just I, and I think that the I hope that the fines are enough I, I hope that you know it's it's more of it's more of a monetary warning I'm gonna call it at $15 but it, maybe that makes them wake up and because and I, and I think what you're gonna see is is people you know your neighbors are gonna be the ones that are telling on you because I'm driving around watching I, I'm watching my neighbor. I get up in the morning and I, I see what, when I see water running down in the curb there along the gutter, I see my, I'm looking to see where that's coming from. So um, I think that's, it's, it's coming and we all need to do our part on that. A couple of things, May Day Fair, April 29th through May the 3rd. You can buy your discount admission and ride tickets at the fair office uh, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and those are on sale until uh, the Tuesday the 28th at 5 p.m. Also I'm going to keep reminding everybody uh, blood drive donate for Debbie uh, it's it's a memory of Debbie Pereira who lost her battle with cancer a few years back but we're, there's a memorial dr blood drive I think this is the fourth annual and that's from 3:30 to 6:30 in the O'Banion building at the fairgrounds June. June 8th June 8th on that Monday June the 8th um, and that's all I have for tonight thank you Hey, thank you. Um, just a couple of announcements. See, the street fair that's coming up, the Rotary is going to have a pancake breakfast, and it's going to be $8. So it'll include ham, and uh, that's because Mrs. Lewis wanted that. And, uh, and so, uh, so if you'd like to buy tickets, you can buy them from any Rotarian. And uh, also, uh, I've seen a number of shopping carts. Uh, they have uh, the reduction in town. Uh, thank you. And if you... I see a shopping cart. I would ask you to call Public Works and um, and report it. Report the location. This this last um, 
this last week I was in Monterey for a CalCog uh, conference, and and some of the the information that was brought out, they're talking more about applications and phone applications. And I know <laughs> this is not the time to ask, but at some point we need to talk about how we can develop apps for the uh, for the general public with the smartphones and how they can report things a lot quicker for us and maybe not going through the phone lines and 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 see what we can do for the citizens uh, and you know, I thought about one thing your shopping carts for one thing because a lot of people just don't use the phone uh, the generations they talked about of the uh, of the new phone users uh, they don't they don't make phone calls they do texting they, uh, they they work with social media so at some point down the road I, I hope we could find the time to uh, to maybe have uh, maybe find some smart high school kid who would like to develop apps for us uh, and Eric, that could help you with the uh, the if someone's missing a cart or a, or a can for the um, for the garbage and where shopping carts are located, uh, in order to to help clean up our town and how we can report things that uh, that, that basically would take time and take uh, time away from a, a dispatcher who has to answer these calls. So um, I don't know if it's possible, but maybe we can move in that direction if the council thinks it's. Uh, it's something we should move into and move into the the next century with the uh, the phone apps uh, because they were they were really touting these at the uh, with Caltrans and uh, and 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 the different uh, municipalities of uh, of of how people conduct and uh, generate business and and what they do to keep abreast in order to to make the best use of time constraints that they have within the city. So uh, for now, though, if you see a shopping cart, please uh, call Public Works and report it. And they will have some, someone is here three or four days a week to pick up those carts. And if that doesn't work, then I'll bring it back to the council level to see what else we can do to, uh, for more beautification projects in town. So with that, we will now go into closed sessions and conference with legal, legal negotiate, or labor negotiators Pursuant to Government Code Section 54957.6, Agency Designated Representative, City Council Manager er, Kerrigan, City Manager Kerrigan, City Attorney Vaughn, City Clerk, Human Resources Officer, Director Maloney, Finance Director Williams, Legal Counsel Tufo, Employee Organizations, Los Banos Police Officers Association, LBPOA, Los Banos Police Sergeants Association, LBPSA, Los Banos Police Dispatchers, Community Services Officers Association, LBPD CSOA and Los Banos Firefighters Association LBFFA and unrepresented miscellaneous employees and B public employee performance evaluation pursuant to government code section 54957 title city manager and if there's anything to report we will do so at the when we return from closed session good night everyone